The Fix is in. The Sports Fix. Portions of the Sports Fix brought to you by GV Art and Design. It's not just a shirt, it's a statement. GVArtwork.com. Sports Fix listeners, don't wait all day or all week to get in on the fun. The party doesn't stop when we go off the air all week long. The Sports Fix social media sites are your one-stop shop for all things Cleveland sports. Jump over to Facebook.com slash The Sports Fix. Facebook.com slash The Sports Fix and become a fan today because we love fans and they create some of the best sports talk in town, Daddy. You'll enjoy talking to your fellow Cleveland sports fans on The Sports Fix fan page. And if Twitter's your thing, well, you know how we do it. Tweet with us at the Sports Fix CLE. It's that simple. Twitter.com slash the Sports Fix CLE, baby. Chat live with the crew during all your favorite Cleveland sports events, tickets and contests and trivia and so much more. Get with us today, the Sports Fix on social media. Facebook.com slash the Sports Fix. Tweet with us at the Sports Fix CLE. Join, Join the, the Sports, sports Fix, fix on, on Facebook and, and Twitter today. today. Hey Cleveland, this is Anderson Varejean of the Cleveland Cavaliers. You are listening to the Sports Fix. Live in Ohio, it's time to get your fix. The Sports Fix. The pitch. A swing and a long drive to right. Down the line it goes. Gone! A walk-off three-run homer for as Drubal Cabrera. And the Indians get their sixth consecutive win. How about that? As Drubal Cabrera with a walk-off three-run homer. Yes, indeed, Cleveland. Welcome in. And how about that? Like my man Hammy says right there in the middle, the wee hours of the night, it turned into late night tribe live. I was, I, you know, I dig that. Then turned into early morning tribe live, baby. And uh, four hours and 29 minutes later, you just heard it. The Indians. Ooh, what a way to, well, that's a way to end any game. Not only a game, a series, a homestand, however you want to talk about it. Uh, we're going to talk about it. What a night it was, the Indians. What a game. I mean, I'll tell you what, man, just unbelievable. The the high drama. You know, we'll get into the, the ins and outs here in a second once we open the show. But the strike of midnight, it was literally the, the struck of midnight, 11.59, flipping over to midnight when uh, the Red Sox tied that game off of Corey Kluber. I looked, and it just happened to catch the corner of my eye as 11.59 flicked over to midnight. And I go, ah, at the stroke of midnight. Well, we're destined to play a little bit more baseball here and. As Drupal Cabrera said, we've played enough baseball here. And, uh, man, I'll tell you what. Whoo, welcome into the Sports Fix. The Indians on their day off as red hot as possible. As as we just recapped there, they finish off not only a three-game sweep of the Red Sox, but a six-game sweep of the homestand, which makes, by the way, Three consecutive sweeps at home by the Indians going back to the Tigers series as well before the last road trip. And what a good set of timing, too, because now you've got the longest road trip of the season coming up. Longest one, not only thus far, but in general, uh, you've got a big 10-game series here. You're going to see Texas. You're going to see Boston. So a lot of... uh, Momentum built up here heading out onto the road. Now, now is going to be a good test. And uh, looking forward to talking about that today, too, with Mike Brandenberry from Did the Try Win Last Night.com. But a good test to see what they can do now on the road because we've seen them play very well at home all season long. Now, let's see if they can transfer this to the road and pick things up there. Welcome into the Sports Fix. We're going to pick things up right here, baby. We're going to open up the phone lines early. A lot going on, of course. Talking tribe Indians here, as we said, head into the road trip on their day off here as absolutely red hot as they can be. Mike Brandenberry from Did the Tribe Win Last Night.com will be with us later on in the show here, just around, oh, just around the end of the first hour here to talk. So, we're going to talk some Indians early. 
early. We're going to take your phone calls. We're going to preview the NBA Finals. I've done, I'll tell you what, in my course of that, I came up with some, and you know, we're going to do a rare uh, uh, conversation where we actually are going to talk a little bit about LeBron James because I came across some interesting, interesting research about uh, the legacy. And I don't know, just throw that word around, but since... Uh, he left Cleveland and nationally looking at uh, the way people look at what he did. Very interesting stuff. Just very interesting to see outside of Cleveland. Um, some good stuff. And this series in general, we'll look at it. We're going to preview it. My man, Tim Duncan, leads the Spurs to battle against LeBron and the Heat tonight. We're going to talk about all of that. Mike will be with us a little bit later. Talking Tribe, your calls and more. Matter of fact, I see the phone lines already ring a ding in here to start the show. So let's kick things off. It's the Sports Fix. I'm Jay Rock, your host with the most, baby, the Big Daddy on the microphone with you here, Jerry Myers, for the duration, Wel- welcoming each and every one of you, whether you're listening live on the sportsfix.net, on TuneIn and the TuneIn radio app worldwide on Spreaker and Mixler, if you're listening on Digital Delay 24-7, day or night, on iHeartRadio, the world's largest internet radio provider, on iTunes and Spreaker Radio, Stitcher, the SoundCloud, all the different platforms, podcast sites, and so much more. Welcome into the show, you guys. We're rocking and rolling today, baby. Cannot wait to dive into it with you. I'm ready to hit the phone. I I, I don't know. I don't I don't know who it is on the phone. We're I'm not, I'm gonna I'm not looking at the number. I'm not even gonna look at it. Uh, we'll see who the first phone call is, but I want you to be the next phone call. Pick up the phone. Give me a call. 216-539-7535. 216-539-7535. Five three nine seven five three five. Get on the phone and give us a call here, Indians fans. I want to hear from you guys today, baby. First and foremost, phone line. Like, we don't always get a chance to open them. You know, you guys know we play the phone game, so they're open here. Take advantage. Two one six five three nine seven five three five. If you can't get to the phones, as you know. Plenty of ways to stay in touch with the show. Hit us up on Facebook, facebook.com slash the sports fix. Tweet with us at the sports fix, C L E, all one word. Easy ways to stay in touch with the show 24 7. We'll read some of the best takes live on the air as we go on, like we always do. Facebook.com slash the sports fix. Tweet with us at the sports fix, C L E. You can email us as well, the sports fix at AOL.com. And as I always say, wrapping this little spiel up, don't forget, show some love to the website, the sports fix.net. You listen to the show live there. You can catch all the replays there. You can get all of our social media widgets, sports headlines 24 7 and more right there at the sportsfix.net. All right, guys, I'm not going to go to the phone lines just yet. I just want to talk a little bit, uh, go into where we started the show, of course, opening up, talking Indians 7-4 to four last night as Drupal Cabrera, bottom of the 12th inning, hits a three-run walk-off home run, the third walk-off home run of his Drupal's career. And what's a, kind of a, a funny little extra fact to that is uh, all three of his Walk-off home runs have been in extra innings. So, uh, well, there you go. And as Drupal continued that there last night, came through when the Indians needed him the most. The Tribe now, six-game winning streak. Longest for the season. Longest winning streak, obviously, since they ended the season hot with those 10 in a row last year. They've also got back. We, we've kind of talked this week about how they kept the last few weeks. You would get, get a little streak going, team streak, as we, they've been dubbed by us here. But they'll get a little bit of going and almost get to 500 and then boom, boom, scale back and then have to climb their way back up. Finally have hit that 500 mark, 60 games. They are now 30 on the plus side, 30 on the downside. First time that the Tribe has got themselves back to 500 since you've got to go back basically to the first 20 some games of the season April 24th they sat at 11 and 11 and that is the last time that the Indians saw 500 they are now 21 and 11 at home obviously we talked at the beginning about nine straight they've won th- swept three straight series here they've won 11 of the last 14 uh, uh unbelievable but now the key is seeing if you can turn that around and get it going on the road because we know what they've got coming ahead and it begins with Texas here after a day off today. Three straight sweeps at home. 
Last time the Indians did that was last year when they fired off an 11-game home winning streak in the middle of July and August. And you know what? Speaking of last year, and, and you, I'll tell you, I can't wait till later to get Mike Brandenberry on the show because this is something him and I have kind of battled about the last few weeks because he's big on the stop comparing this year to last year. But 60 games this year, 30 and 30. Guess what? 60 games last year. Take a guess what the Indians record was after 60 games last year. It shouldn't take you long to figure out where I'm going with this. They were 30 and 30 after 60 games last year as well. The difference is this year's Indians team in, it has worked their way back up to 500. They've begun to warm up now after a bad or slow start to the season. Last year, remember, it was the exact opposite. They started well and then were kind of falling off. The you know wheels were falling off the bus. They were just getting ready to hit. Or I think at this time last year, they were in the middle of that eight game losing streak, which dropped their record. Uh, they were 30, let's see, they uh, 30 and 25 through 55 games, ended up falling to 30 and 33 through 63 games after that eight game losing streak. So uh, a little bit of different momentum in how they got there, but amazingly, you look, and they are sitting exactly where they were. And then Corey Kluber had a good line. And, and I'll tell you what. This is funny because we talked about this exact thing. I can't remember if it was yesterday with Dan or, but I remember saying sometimes I wor worry that, you know, there's good and bad to that taking a day to day thing because sometimes you get that lack of urgency, you know, especially you get frustrated with the way they play defense. But, you know, uh, Corey Kluber, uh, and he was so animated in his face as he was saying this. You should have seen him. He was making all kinds of gyrations with this. No, he actually, he was making a Corey Kluber face. I love it, man. <laughs> There's a meme going around on the internet that's hilarious. It's uh, like the 15 faces of Corey Kluber, and it's the same face, and it's just got a different n emotion name underneath it. You know, angry, sad, happy, hungry, all of that. And uh, it's pretty funny, actually. I should, I, I, I haven't shared it on the page. I, I will. I don't do too much of that, but this one was pretty, uh, pretty funny. I thought, but he said, uh, this, the way they've gotten here is part of taking it day by day. He said, you, you know, you don't worry about the, the record, you know, you're fighting an uphill battle here. There's so much time left that you just know you're going to get on a roll and, and then boom, here you go. And he's absolutely right. You see what they did at home. And, uh, you know what? I was going to bring this up anyway, but uh, I see it right in front of me. I, I got to say, it's easy to go who hit the walk-off, who who gets the, the glory here, the, the sung hero, but the unsung hero, man, and, and somebody who, as much as he's been maligned, whether it's going to be in the rotation or now in the bullpen, somebody who, who really has the tools to play a piece in what these Indians are trying to do. And by the way, just a sideline, as uh, as we mentioned before, and I think Bruce mentioned it yesterday when he called in, but, I mean, it's going to take even more than, than, what, 49 guys or whatever to win uh, to win this division this year. I mean, Indians just getting contributions from everybody. We talked about how cool it was to see Nick Hagedone step up and, and really uh, come out there and, and really and two nights in a row now. We've seen him kind of doing some things that you go, man, that would be really nice to see if we can get him going because he's always been tantalizing with that talent. Carlos Carrasco last night, give him credit too. He gets the victory, four strikeouts, uh, very efficient and very effective with what he's done. And look at his stats since he has gone in the bullpen. And this is this is this will really go to show you that I think – as much as you wished he could have been in your rotation, if you're the Indians, the the move to the bullpen is effective here. Carrasco, 16 innings in the bullpen. He's got a 2.2 ERA. He's got 15 Ks, and he's only walked four people. I mean, that's very effective. I mean, he's averaging a strikeout an inning and a walk every four innings. You know, very. He's he's really got himself, I think, a spot there where he can really contribute and be effective for this team going forward, which is going to be important. It's a team, as we say all the time, that is the uh, 
sum is more than the individual parts. And man, cooking a lot. But and I can't wait to get Mike on because just do the hey man. So I know we're not comparing to last year, but we are because here they sit. As we said, wrapping it full circle, 30 and 30 through the first 60 games. And uh, here we go, heading into a big road trip. I, You know what? Let me, I was going to go to the phones. I know I've got a caller on hold. Let me get the first break out of the way now. This way we can come back and just take this phone call clean. And we'll take any of your calls. 216-539-7535. 216-539-7535. Hit us up. Facebook and Twitter. Facebook.com slash the sports fix. Tweet with us at the sports fix C L E because Indians fever, baby. It's cooking. Well, it never really dies down here on the Sports Fix, but uh, uh, it's cooking. It should be cooking all around town. Last night, I mean, it was worth the wait uh, for the people that were there, for the people that had to wait it out, for the people that stayed up and waited until 2 o'clock in the morning when that thing wrapped up. But uh, four hours and 29 minutes of baseball and however much more of rain delays, all worth it. As Drupal made them all go home happy, baby. And uh, we're going to keep talking about that right here as the Indians sweep the homestand. Much needed. Heading into the road here. Heading into a tough 10-game road trip. But that's tomorrow is when that starts. Today, we're feeling good and talking to you about it. 216-539-7535. We're talking Tribe. we got NBA Finals previews. Mike Brandenberry from Did the Tribe Win Last Night coming up and so much more. We have just begun the sports fix. Hey, you know what? Do me a favor. I haven't said this in a while. Go tell somebody else to listen to the show if you don't mind. Go hit us up on your social media. Go and tell somebody to tune in. Send the link to the show you're listening to right now. Say, hey, buddy, click here and listen to the Sports Fix because J-Rock's a bad mamma jamma. Or, you know, not putting words in your mouth. You can say it any way you want, but, you know, you can feel free to use that one if you like. We'll be right back. You're listening to the Sports Fix. The Sports Fix, the show that asks the question. We'll be right back. Before we go to the break, guys, I want to talk to you just a second about our friends at GV Art and Design. Baseball's here once again. Cleveland, of course, excited. And GV Artwork teaming up with the Indians. And they're both going to knock it out of the park this season. And listen to some of the new designs they've got for Cleveland baseball fans everywhere. They've dug out an old classic. And they're bringing the heat with the new wild thing, Give them the Heater Ricky design. GV Artwork is teaming up with Cleveland fan favorite Michael Brantley and created a custom Dr. Smooth t-shirt plus don't forget they've got the cleveland that i glove collection new tribal and cleveland that i love designs for women and so much more you can get gv artwork designs on the website gvartwork.com and don't forget to use the sales code fix 10 that's fix one zero and you'll save 10 percent on your purchase or you can check out their new store in lakewood on detroit avenue check them out in the indians team shops and so much more cleveland that we all love gv art and design. It's not just a shirt, it's a statement. Hey Sports Fix fans, I'm Fred McLeod, TV voice for the Cavaliers. When I'm not busy taking elbows from my buddy Austin Carr, I'm tuning in to see what the guys are saying. Come on, Cavs! The engines are cranking and purring, and that can only mean one thing. Bike nights are back at Harry Buffalo North Olmstead. Rev up your hogs and head on down to Harry Buffalo North Olmstead every Monday night. Enjoy $3, $3 drinks, drinks and beers, beers $5 pizzas, and crazy, crazy wing specials, specials for, for all bikers, bikers, all on their open patio. Woo-hoo! Hot bikes, good friends, and great times are waiting for you. 4824 Great Northern Boulevard, right outside Great Northern Mall. Monday bike nights at Harry Buffalo. The, the proud, proud sponsor, sponsor of the, of the Sports, Sports Fix. Fix. Sports Fix listeners, like us on Facebook today. Facebook.com slash the Sports Fix. At the corner of Carnegie and Ontario, it's basketball time at the Q. Have you gotten your copy of Cleveland's Finest yet? Highlighting the best moments, players, and media members in Cleveland sports history. Oh God, he won it! Milo hit a three-pointer on the sideline! 
In-depth, personal interviews with some of the top names in Cleveland sports fill the pages of this incredible book. Joe Day. Fred McLeod. Hector Marinero. Discussing the most intimate and sometimes controversial details of the largest moments in our town's sports history. The Indians have won the divisional title. A perfect game for Lynn Barker. What a win for the Cleveland Cavaliers. Their first time in the playoffs. It's the first book written from the player's point of view, with the media that covered it and the fans that watched. Finally, the true stories are told. From a miracle in Richfield to the NBA Finals. The Detroit Pistons have been booby trapped. From a perfect game to a World Series one pitch from victory. From a Wildcat High School dynasty to the golden days of the Browns, Barons, and Crunch, this book will change the way the entire sports nation looks at Cleveland. Cleveland, you will have an October to remember. Cleveland's Finest by Vince McKee is this year's must-have book for every Cleveland sports fan. Available now at Amazon.com. Copy today. Portions of the Sports Fix brought to you by Quick Lane at Valley Ford Truck, home of the low price tire guarantee. Quicklane.com slash Valley Ford Truck. You're listening to the Sports Fix. Welcome back to the Sports Fix Live here on the SportsFix.net. J-Rock back with you. We are rolling here. Got the phone lines open. 216-539-7535. 216-539-7535. You know what? Oh, what the hell. One more time, just for the hell of it. Here's what we're happy about last night in the 12th inning at 2 o'clock in the morning. Take a listen to this. The pitch. A swing and a long drive to right. Down the line it goes. Gone! A walk-off three-run homer for as Drubal Cabrera. And the Indians get their sixth consecutive win. How about that? As Drubal Cabrera with a walk-off three-run homer. How about that? And I'll tell you what, speaking of how about that, you know what? You want it, we're giving kudos, talking about Hagedone and Carrasco and, and obviously the big hero as Drubal. But how about this given kudos? The Indians have now gone three consecutive games without an error. I mean, seriously, I, I'm saying it with a smile. You can probably hear that through the radio. But all joking aside, that is key. They've now gone 37 innings in a row without an error. And I mean... Baby steps here, baby. Baby steps, man. But uh, that's three in a row. And that clean baseball is what it's going to take no matter what happens with the pitching, with the hitting. That's the key to this whole thing. And really, we're beginning to see that come together, too. A couple of other numbers here. I'm going to the phone lines now. A couple of other numbers from last night. 14 more strikeouts for the Indians. 541 on the season for the Indians pitching staff strikeouts. I mean, whatever it is, it's clearly become something that uh, is becoming habit with these guys. And Corey Kluber, the rain man, by the way, bringing the rain again last night. We haven't mentioned that. There's no coincidence there, but a little bit, uh, I don't know, a little bit less than Corey Kluberish, but still a good performance from him last night. I mean, if he doesn't. If, well, we don't stay up until 2 o'clock in the morning, perhaps, but if he doesn't struggle there at the end and, and give up the two runs, then perhaps we're talking even better about in light of what he did last night. Uh, and maybe when you look back at that month of May, that's what makes it, uh, uh, you, you go, wow, a little bit off. But I just thought, you know, uh, the rain, the late start and all that. I, I told you guys, four hours and 29 minutes for the game. Well, the rain delay was two and a half. So you're talking about basically seven hours no, 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 that's not even getting there early. That's if you got to the game at game time and sat it out seven hours between the rain delay and then the, the four and a half hours of the game. So, you know, I think that plays a part in it, too. And uh, and again, I think if he doesn't stumble right there at the end, uh, I, I do believe that perhaps the tribe just wins that thing. And who knows? Maybe it was destined to go into extra innings. But uh, anyways, and we'll talk more about some of these numbers and ins and outs. But I promised I was going to the phones to you. And I am caller. You're up on the sports fix. Good morning, J Rock. Good morning. This is Bruce. What's up, man? Hey, not much. I called to talk about them young Indians. <laughs> them young Indians, but, uh, baby. Hey, I had to keep Big Bob in mind there. That's but, right. Uh, a couple of things about last night's game. Let's um, do it. 
Other than the uh, hey, you were the there, right? The two you, you, were, you were there. You were there. Yeah. No. Yeah. What time did you get yeah, there? Yeah. So I mean, the rain delay was just ridiculous. But what time I mean, did it you wasn't there, even Bruce? raining hard. They could have played. What time did you get but, there? Pardon me. What time did you get to the game? Um, it was about uh, ten to six. Ten to six. What time did you head home? Uh, twenty after two. Look at it. So there you go. There's the night that they had to put in last night at the ballpark. Just to put it in perspective. That you should have got paid for that, you people that went there last night, because you put in a full eight hour shift last night for sure. But we were paid. I mean, you got that I mean, right. It was, you we, got, we got that the right. Win in the end, and that's all that mattered. But yes, sir. Um, a couple of things about last night's game, though, that kind of um, caught my eye. I was sitting on the third base side, about three rows. Um, opposite the Indians' dugout. Okay. So I was relatively close to the field. Now, needless to say that Azubo Cabrera leads the league in F-bombs because every time he misses a pitch or strikes <laughs> out, he, you could hear him screaming it last night. Um, when Carrasco came in, okay, okay he um, threw the first pitch like right under the guy's chin, and the second pitch hit him in the elbow. And uh, Cabrera walked over to the pitcher's mound and said, look, you know, you got to slow your ass down, you know. You're just, you know, you're in too big a rush. And after that, he was he was almost Locked perfect. In. Yeah, exactly. And, I mean, it's not just Cabrera with the bat or Cabrera making errors or whatever he's doing, you know. He's actually, like, taking charge of the field now. And, 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 know, and I love as Drupal, man. I I. I put myself on the line with him and said that this team needed him to reach their full uh, capability this season. And uh, and I've been disappointed so far, but you're right. Trust me, I know how key he can be. And uh, Jason Giambi hit that double down the line last night. You actually heard the man grunt. I mean, he, you he wanted to hit his leg to the river or something, you know. But. Well, you just reminded me, though, and it, it was funny because I noticed a lot of people pointing it out on, on my uh, Late Night Tribe Twitter timeline last night. But uh, it was, you know, when you get the, the crowd thinned out and you're down into the wee hours of the of the early morning like that, you can hear everything. Everything. Like on TV and on the radio, you can hear every cat call, every individual comment, you know, it's uh, it's uh, it's always pretty funny to me the things that you hear it, when you get in that situation, because it's amazing that you're in this giant park and that you can pick out the, but you really, you can hear every individual thing, you know? Yep, you can hear, like, people talking in the dugout is how silent that place was, and I mean, we were making noise. Oh yeah, and, but I mean, and look, that's a that's you a can long still time. hear everything. That's a long time, even if you're a baseball guy. And I'm not. There's no way I would criticize people that even left. If you left at midnight, even because there's people have jobs. I mean, obviously school's out, but people still have to go to work. There's a lot of people that putting in eight nine hours in the ballpark last night. That's a testament to those that did stay. And and that's one of the occasions where I would not fault somebody that left because I get it. You you have things to do. You expected to be there for three four hours tops. You know you you ended up there for an eight hour shift. Exactly, and even John Adams, the drummer, fell asleep, and he was that still was drumming. Funny. That was funny. Getting him, he's caught on. He's asleep, and he's still he's drumming asleep, but along. He's still drumming. <laughs> I mean, that he was wasn't beating funny. the drum; he was tapping it, but he was I still. Know. The guy beats the drum in his sleep. He's been drumming. He's been but, drumming for so long that he can do it in his sleep, man. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Get a kick out of that last night, and but, didn't and, miss you know a what, beat. Bruce, I mean, it was like you know. You and could barely every- hear him, but you knew he was out there. <laughs> For sure. And it was everybody from uh, Michael Brantley uh, starting things off and right on through the usual suspects. Talk to me a little bit outside of just the game last night. We're sitting here at, at you heard, you know, talking earlier, the same point, same record here, this point, although trending upwards instead of down. But uh, talk to me a little bit about where you think the Indians are uh, at this point, man, how are you feeling about the the prospects for what's yet to come? Um, I'm not up or down, actually. Um, I'm kind of like, um, you know, with the wait and see attitude, you know. I mean, they're playing good ball right now with no errors. You know, I mean, they made some great plays last night. Yeah, they uh, did. 
Kipnis Kipnis made that, couple, that yeah. stop behind second, jumped in yes. the air, threw it a strike to to Chisenhall. That was like you know unreal. That was shades you know of uh, Kuiper. And you, yeah, I agree. He was on. And you know what? I think just like we talk about bad, uh, bad baseball and errors and that stuff, be bad defense being contagious. I think it works the other way around. You know what I'm saying? I think it. Sure. I think it works the opposite way. When you see guys flashing that leather and making those plays, it fires everybody up to focus just a little bit more, to try just a little bit harder. You know, and uh, and I love it. I think you're, you're seeing a bit of that too. The Bradley catch against the scoreboard and to see Kluber turn around and actually clap his hands, you know, like, you know, that was, you know, I mean, it's like everybody's starting to either pick each other up or at least appreciate what everybody else is doing. Absolutely. You know, you know what's another key is that they jumped out in front several times in this series. And then by they, I mean the Indians. They outscored Boston 6 nothing in the first inning during this series, which was important each step of the way. We talked about how key it was to put the, the three spot on PV before he got rolling. And, and again, whether it's one run or three, getting ahead, especially against a team like Boston. And I, I look back, too, man, at... Again, no disrespect to the Colorado Rockies, but I think the second sweep here was was way bigger and better um, of a test than the first. They came in on what was it seven seven in a row? Boston right. come in seven on game a winning streak. seven game winning streak, and and they, this is still Boston. This is still the uh, a powerful lineup and a dangerous team to play. And we're sitting and here coming out of the back world end of a sweep. Yeah, just coming out of the back end of a sweep. Look at, they're another team that beat us up last year, you know. And remember early on, uh, Boston and New York uh, were, were getting a hold of us and, and taking, because we would, I remember talking about how I'm glad we play in the Central and we don't have to play the East teams because the East was beaten up on the Indians early last season in the early to middle part, you know. But look at, again, and that shows too, just like Detroit, like Chicago with us, again, a focus on a team that beat you up last year. Look at the turnaround around here is you've picked up a couple of victories early on against Boston, but I think them coming in so hot, that makes me feel even better about this, is the fact that the Indians were able to uh, to to win the first two, and then focus through a rain delay, focus through everything, and late night and come through and win that third one again. I, I'm, I'm, very, I'm feeling very good, and the reason I'm up a little bit here is because this, this is what I thought this team should play like, obviously not winning it, every game and and but this is kind of what I saw this team coming together as and and we're hitting it just in the first week of June or so which is with the weather warming up it's when this team started to come together last year it was the back end of June but here we go again so tell me it's not last year all you want but uh this is the yeah, same it's team looking awful close exactly. and it still has the ups and downs exactly you know we haven't hit the 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 second down spot yet this is way more last year's team than people want to give credit for. The only but, difference uh, is they live. I don't know if it. the camera showed last night or not, but on the Ortiz home run, yeah, that barely made it into the stands. Yeah. Um, did they show afterwards that um, um, Murphy and Bourne were talking to each other? Well, they were um, hot because he was watching the uh, watching the home run go. You know. Yeah, they were just kind of like standing there for a second. Then all of a sudden, they both started like running back, and it was like you know after the ball had landed in the in the stands. Obviously, I don't know. Um, they looked at each other like you know, uh, just go for the ball. Don't look at me, you know. And uh, and it was like you know that. there was there's still like a little lack of communication between Bourne and and the other two fielders. And not so much Brantley, because Brantley is a, a reformed center fielder. But Murphy is, like, tentative when he goes after uh, fly balls hitting the gap. I don't know if anybody else has picked up on that or anything, but that's the way it kind of seems to me, that he's almost afraid to call Bourne off a ball. Well, you know what? That takes time, what you're talking about there. When you've got new guys working together in the outfield, you're going to have that a little bit. I, I know what you're saying there as far as calling guys off and stuff like that. And I think we've seen a couple of those this season, you know, where you've had some of those miscues out there. So 
Um, I think that just comes with time and getting to know guys and getting to know their getting to know their body language too, so that when somebody does forget to call it or call somebody off, you can tell when you need to back off. You know, I think that's that comes with familiarity of playing together. But you're right. I mean, we've seen several instances of a little bit of those outfield miscues like that. Well, you know, that ball could have easily been caught by one of them had they, you know, just ran back to the wall. But I mean, it it was definitely hit. I mean, no doubt about it. But you know, it it could have been a play made on it anyway. And they were both kind of like standing there for a second before they both took off running to the wall. And it just seemed, uh, you know, like a little like lack of communication or nobody wanted to take charge right away. On bo- on balls hit the center field. Bourne is waving his arms like immediately. You know, if he's near the ball or not, he's waving his arm like, yeah, I can get to that. And I think that that's kind of helping both, you know, Brantley and, and Murphy out. But I think it's because sometimes he has uh, Velas or Rayburn in right field, and, uh, and you know, they're not real sure on what they can go get and what they right. can't. No, I'm sure you're right, and that's something to keep an eye on. You're probably right about that aspect of it. But, um, you know, Cabrera last night, I mean, I just, you know, uh, the first thing that came to my mind was like, you know, hey, this guy's finally taking charge of this team, you know. He's been here the longest. And, you know, when he went out and and yelled at Carrasco last night, it was like, hey, you know, just slow it down, you know. You're, You're not getting in any kind of rhythm because you're not taking your time. And after that, he was, you know, like lights out. So that was just a couple of things that caught my eye last night was the outfield was a little tentative and the uh, Cabrera wanted to step in and be uh, Tito for a minute, you know. <laughs> and uh, it worked. I mean, I mean, it actually showed that, you know, he's, he's taking the initiative, you know. I mean, he is the captain of the infield. And... You know that's that's the way it should have been. Yeah. But you know you got to give Kipnis credit though. I mean that that guy went after that ball last night. It was a sure hit up the middle. I 100% agree, brother. Oh, uh, he he leaped in the air and threw that strike. It was like Chisenhall didn't even have to move his glove. It was like man, I I told my buddy I said man that that looked like Dwayne Kite. I mean, it was just crazy. You know, you haven't seen plays like that in a while. And usually it kicks off their glove and Bourne's picking it up in center field. But the uh, the people that went there last night to see uh, Johnny football, I hate to bring this up. Yeah. But, but, you know, nobody left. I mean, even though he didn't throw out the first pitch, I mean, he still walked out and, and you know, waved to the crowd and did his little money thing and, you, you know, know what? I got to call so, you on the carpet, Bruce. I got to call you on the carpet. You're making your little comments about how much he was going to draw. And, oh, Ben Tate only drew 19,000. Hey, Johnny Football. The, the, was only the drew 20. 10, 20. That'll just, yeah. I mean, I'm just, I, I got to laugh. I, I don't, I have fun with you about the, I look, I like, uh, I like the Browns, so I want John Manziel to be good. But I had to laugh. When I saw the attendance, I said, ah, he drew about, a, what, 600 people more than uh, Ben Tate and I did. But, uh, and I uh, thought you might say something, so I was all ready with, you know, <laughs> hey, it was chilly, it was rainy, you know. Come on, man. This was the, the all true Johnny football, The Browns stayed away. I can't, I can't, you know. No, it was. Uh, I just. I. I was gonna rib you whether you called or whether I was just saying it on the air. But what is it? Was the attendance? It was for fifty-five for the weekend. So I was, or for the series, I should say. I was about twenty. Yeah. Twenty grand off of my. I said let's get seventy-five. I was shooting for the moon, I guess. But uh, no, I still, said I said they'd get twenty-five last night, and if it would have been a nice night, they might have. And that's probably it. You know what? In all honesty, in all fairness, I mean, who thought that game was even going to happen? I was sure. I had somebody ask us on Facebook, hey, J-Rock, you think they're going to get this game in? I said, man, I said, they're going to wait a while because they want to try to get this thing in. But I don't know because I didn't think it was going to let up. And then sure enough, it finally did start to uh, fizzle out. And I said, man, they're going to be playing until 2 o'clock in the morning. And sure enough, they played until 2 o'clock in the morning. Well, they said on the scoreboard that they were going to wait it out as long as they could because the next available day that both of them have off is like August 11th. August something, yeah, exactly. It was just one of those so, where you really had to try to get this in if you in any way could get this thing in, you know? 
And so and they, they said, you know, they were going to wait as long as they could. They did, though. Hey, they got it in, you know. Yeah, they sure did. And I'm, I'm going to let you go, but uh, I wanted to bring up that thing about Cabrera, you know, because I'm, I'm not sure if anybody was really paying attention, but he actually acted like a, a field general last night. And I want to see more of that out of Ezra. And you know what? When he gets, and he's gotten a little bit here, when he gets going offensively as well, and and defensively, it makes it easier for him to do that and take that leadership because it's much easier to lead when you've got your own example, you know, when, when your own house is in order, I guess. And I think maybe that was one of the things, too, with this team is everybody was going through their individual struggles, for the most part, with the exception of a couple of guys who we've pointed out. So it makes it harder for guys to... Um, you know, I don't know, maybe I'm, I don't know if I'm right about that, but you would think you got too many guys who need to get their own house in order where it's hard for somebody to step up and take leadership because, you know, it's hard to, to say, hey, let's do this this way when you're hitting 188 or something like that. You know what I mean? So I think exactly. as these guys, yeah, as they feel more confident of their own season, as guys are now hitting, guys are starting to feel better, et cetera, et cetera, then they feel more confident to take that leadership role because they're feeling better about themselves i think that's a little part of what's going on here too everybody's doing better which allows this team to be what it is which is a team and and that's the key it's going to be the key at the end of the season it's the key now all the way through is getting contributions across the board and uh one other thing the um on the home run last night before cabrera even got to first base one of the first people out of the dugout was jason giambi so for a 42-year-old man, he could still move pretty good. <laughs> he could you still know? get out there. He beat there, the crowd. You know? He had Absolutely. the cup of water in hand. He was ready to go. Absolutely. I wanted to make sure that I seen who jumped out of the dugout first, and, and Giambi was one of the first ones out with the cup of water. Absolutely. So. I mean, listen, man, from that perspective, I'm all about Jason Giambi, man. He he definitely loves this team. He loves his teammates, and he is a he is a hell of a teammate, and, and I won't let anybody take that away from him no matter what you think about uh, what's left in the tank for him. He's a hell of a stan why he's there. That's why I have not ever really done the whole get rid of Jason Giambi thing. You know what I mean? I understand well, the- I'll People tell you another thing. The big thing in the crowd last night was uh, talking about Santana coming back on Friday and where's he going to play. Well, it's or not just him. Gonna I mean, you got Swish is going to be less than a week probably behind that too. So, you know, uh, definitely both of those are going to be some conversations. Now, Santana, you know, you've got a few places you can bounce him around. Chisholm Hall is what really throws a monkey wrench with both of those guys because you're trying to find him as much time as possible. I mean, this guy... He mostly, I mean, I'll tell you what, not only is he on the verge of getting himself qualified for uh, for being in the, the batting leader category, but he's going to find himself in some, some all-star discussions if he has another couple of weeks, like the rest of his first part of the season has been. I mean, Lonnie Chisenhall is really... Uh, we've talked about, I mean, you have to keep finding ways to get him on the field and you've got guys. Yeah. You can bounce him around, especially with swish being out. You buy yourself a little bit in an extra week or 10 days of first base, being able to, to get Chisholm over there a little bit too. But yeah, once you get both of those guys back, there's going to be some real decisions to make because, and I, I, I'm, I just believe in not messing with uh, things. If it ain't broke, don't fix it kind of thing. Right. Uh, these I don't want to mess with the chemistry out. at all right. right now. These guys have been out, and I'm not saying that the Indians are winning because these guys are out. But for whatever reason, what's going right now has been going well. You're going to have to balance that if you're Terry Francona in what moves you do make because you don't want to mess with what's been going good. And you, you, you know, you know that if they monkey around and try to force Santana and Swisher in instead, of, you know, and let's just say they go on a, a couple game losing streak. I mean, instantly you, you kind of look at that and go, man, you messed with the good thing. So I don't envy the decisions that now, Terry Francona is going to have to make here in the next week or two. Did it seem to you that, you know, since them two have been down, that uh, guys are playing harder? Yes. You know, I mean, it's whatever like we're trying it is. to make up for what, what we're missing here. But they weren't really missing it. anything because the two lowest hitting guys on the team are the ones that are out. Maybe that's it, but you're right. I mean, whether it's playing harder or just playing better or whatever, the, the last stretch has been very good. So you're right. There is some 
some coalition there somewhere. I don't know what, but. I don't know if they're trying to say we don't we hey we don't really need these two or you know let's play because they're not in there. You know, there are regular guys and and they're not in the lineup so the guys that are taking their place have to play that much harder. That could very well be a part of it. That's a good way to look at it too. I mean, everybody sees that two of your main even though they haven't been producing, everybody knows they're there and they haven't been producing but they're your guys so you do try right. a little harder. Yeah, so you're taking his place. You don't want to, you know, like I don't, I don't want to say take up the slack, but you don't want to slack off any. You know, you want to, you want to maintain the same thing that the guy you're replacing is doing or better. And they have. I'm with you, Bruce. I'm with. You. I'm feeling good. My man. only problem is, you know, the bullpen's going to get burned out sooner or later, and Gomes is about beat to death behind home plate. So we need Santana back, if if nothing else, just to back him up. Well, there's the other thing, too, and Santana's talked about, you know, he wouldn't mind getting behind the plates more because he misses being a catcher, and that I think that could work out very well. That's the good thing about that is that, you know, even if you just wanted to give, you know, Gomes a week and say, hey, we'll we'll, we'll, we'll DH you one or two times here during the week, but we're just going to kind of let you get get your legs underneath you for the next uh, stretch of two months or whatever, you do have the luxury of, of doing that because you got Santana and you're looking for room for Chisholm Hall. So I'm not saying well, you want to take that. And the foul ball gave him a concussion. You know, I know. Like, I, I how, know. how many times you got to put a guy back there with a head injury? You know. I know, man. I know. Good lord! I mean, he's been better off. They just let go and start the game to start with. You know, the first pitch of the game hit him in the head. Absolutely, man. I know what you're saying too. I knew you so, were going to say that. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> All right, I'm going to let you go. All right, my man, Bruce. How you, hey, Bruce. Yes. Before I let you go, I'm going to talk about it in a little bit here on the show anyway, but uh, I know you're a, I know you're a you-know-who guy from down you-know-where, but uh, NBA Finals starting tonight. Do you think that uh, your guy makes it three in a row, or do the Spurs take care of business? I'm telling you, Tim Duncan is coming for money. It's hard Tim to Duncan go against coming. Duncan and Parker. I mean, not, you know. They're coming. Uh, and, and and they lost last year and they're they're looking for revenge. I I I wouldn't be disappointed if either team won. I mean I'm a diehard LeBron fan, you know that. And but you can't take anything away from Duncan and Parker. You know, the the Spurs deserve to be there if not more. You know, they had to work harder. They had, you know, three regular guys and a bunch of foreigners, you know. And uh and so, uh, it depends on how you look at it. If LeBron plays like LeBron, they'll win. If LeBron plays like he did in, you know, a couple of them games, uh, you know, I'm, I wouldn't be disappointed if the Spurs won. All right, I just figured I'd ask you. I just figured I'd ask you where you were chiming in. I got some interesting stuff to talk about that later, but I'm gonna change. I'm gonna change things up. We're gonna keep the tribe talk going. Bruce, thank you so much for the call, my man, Mike. Brandon, All right, J. Rock. Have a good one, Bruce. From did the tribe win last night.com. He's going to be with us next. We will keep the conversation going. Talking some Indians baseball live here on Sports Fix. And your laughter too. We going to celebrate your party with you. Come on now. We here at the Sports Fix want to make all of your dreams come true. What about my dream? Edith, I told you I can't build your candy house. It will fall down. The sun will melt the candy. It won't work. It will if it never rains. Oh, maybe not all of them. Get your fix on the Sports Fix. Hey guys, before we go to the break, I want to talk to you a little bit again about our good friends at Harry Buffalo North Olmstead. Of course, you know during Brown season, we're there each and every week. What a fun time it was last year. But not just that, so many more reasons for you to check out the Harry Buffalo today. The UFC, the ultimate fighting championships, some of the hottest fights in the world today, each and every one of their huge events. Harry Buffalo is one of the few places in Northeast Ohio you can go there and watch each and every UFC fight at the Harry 
Buffalo. And let me tell you, I've been there. The people are out the door. They are to the rafters. It is one of the craziest environments for some UFC fights. Wing Mondays, they've got great deals on wings and drinks. And every day of the week, there's a different special, a different deal. And don't forget the Bison Burger, the unbelievable. It is the combination of a fantastic burger and eating healthy combined into one unbelievable sandwich you have got to get a bison burger while you're there so whatever you're looking for whatever day of the week monday through friday saturday sundays there's something for you at the harry buffalo north olmstead just outside great northern mall check them out today harry buffalo join the herd this is head coach gary waters at cleveland state and you're listening to the sports fix Whether it's an oil change or a new set of tires, Quick Lane at Valley Ford Truck has you covered for your automotive car care needs. They're your neighborhood quick service experts. They also offer a low price tire guarantee. Choose from 13 brands, and if you find the same tires at a lower price within 30 days, Quick Lane at Valley Ford will refund the difference. They're open late Monday through Thursday until 9 p.m. and open early Saturday so you can check it off your to-do list and get on with your day. They also have a newly remodeled service lounge and additional service bay just for Quick Lane oil changes. Quick Lane at Valley Ford Truck is located at 5715 Canal Road, right under the 480 Bridge in Valley View, just down the road from Independence. 5715 Canal Road, right under the 480 Bridge in Valley View, just down the road from Independence. Come see why life is better in the Quick Lane. Quicklane.com slash Valley Ford Truck. That's Quicklane.com slash Valley Ford Truck. Business owners and professionals, do you want to take your business, your product, your team, your event to the next level? You want to advertise right here with the Sports Fix. Our listeners are among the most loyal listeners, terrestrial or internet. The Sports Fix universe is not only the radio show, but tens of thousands of fans on Facebook and Twitter. Email me, Jerry Myers, the Sports Fix at AOL.com. That's the Sports Fix at AOL.com. And let me help you swing for the fences and hit it out of the park right here on the Sports Fix. The Sports Fix is now available every day on the world's largest internet radio service, iHeartRadio. Download the free iHeartRadio app, subscribe to the show, and get your fix. News break. Good morning, I'm Doug Brown. The rematch starts tonight in San Antonio. The Spurs and the Miami Heat tip off game one of the NBA Finals. Last year, the Heat won a terrific series in seven. Of the 12 previous finals rematches, none have gone seven games in both years. Game one coverage starts at 8.30 Eastern on ABC and at 8 Eastern here on ESPN Radio. ESPN's Ramona Shelburne reports Donald Sterling hasn't signed yet, but is prepared to agree with the deal that will sell the Clippers to Steve Ballmer. Sterling will agree with the lifetime ban from the NBA and will not sue the league. The French Open women's semifinals today in Paris. Both matches live on ESPN2. Right now, 20-year-old Jeannie Bouchard is up a set 6-4 on Maria Sharapova. Later, it'll be Simona Halep against Andrea Petkovic. Baseball lifer Don Zimmer died in Florida last night. Zimmer was always proud to say he never cashed a check outside baseball. He was a senior advisor for the Rays at the end of his career. He played with Jackie Robinson on the only Brooklyn Dodgers championship team. Is your car's air conditioning not blowing cold enough air? Bring back the cold in under 10 minutes with Do-It-Yourself AC Pro. AC Pro's fast, easy. You don't need any special tools or skills. Go to acprocold.com for the store nearest you. Now, back to the Sports Fix. Welcome back to the Sports Fix Live here on the SportsFix.net. J-Rock back with you as we roll into our two, baby. Numero dos heading your way. Welcome back as we step to the Sports Fix. Welcome in whether you're listening live on the SportsFix.net on TuneIn and 
TuneIn's radio application worldwide and on Spreaker and my posse over there and Mixler and the Mixler.com chat room as well. And everybody listening on Digital Delay 24-7 on iHeartRadio, the world's largest internet radio provider. Those who on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, SoundCloud, all the various podcast formats as well. Welcome in to the Sports Fix in just a minute. Phone lines are closed because my man Mike Brandenberry from did the tribe win last night.com is going to join us here as we continue talking about the Indians. We've gone through the entire first hour here. I know unheard of in Cleveland sports talk radio. The entire first hour has gone through. And with the exception of Bruce's mention of Johnny football's uh, throwing out of the, well, almost throwing out of the first pitch last night. Uh, we've just been talking baseball, baby. I don't know how. I don't. I. They said it couldn't be done, but uh, somehow we've done it. Rebels, scoundrels over here at the Sports Fix. But we're going to talk to Mike and continue talking about the Indians here on the heels of the homestand sweep and late night tribe magic and late night tribe live last night as the Indians walk off and sweep the Red Sox as we've been talking about. Welcome back in. We're still going to preview the NBA Finals. I've got some very interesting, uh, I saw a really interesting article I want to talk about too about uh, the last few years of LeBron James since he left Cleveland, since the decision and, and the way uh, it's really the opposite of what you would think, the way his national reputation has uh, is still seen today after what he did. It's pretty interesting. It's really it caught me by surprise because I really thought that outside of Cleveland, maybe things were looked at differently, but kind of amazing. We'll talk about all of that as we talk basketball next coming up. But right now we're talking Tribe with Mike Brandenberry from did the tribe win last night.com. You can hit us up facebook.com slash sports fix or tweet with us at the sports fix CLE. Mike Brandenberry, how you doing, my man? I'm doing good. You went a whole hour and just talked Indians. Is, That's all we've been doing, like a, man. Some kind of is there like some kind of form or something you have to file? I didn't even know that was allowed. <laughs> That's what I said. I thought they there said. were laws against that. I thought <laughs> you had to use the word Browns, football, and Johnny at least every five minutes. I, I thought that was a requirement you, in order to discuss Cleveland sports. It's an urban legend, brother. I mean, they say it could not be done, but look, look, we are three minutes away from doing the impossible, going an entire 60-minute stretch of talking only about Cleveland. Oh, I'm sorry. We did talk for about 45 seconds when Bruce called in about his prediction on the NBA Finals, his non-prediction prediction, by the way, Bruce. Nice. If you're going to be a LeBron guy, at least stick by your guy. But anyway, so yeah, uh, we're rolling, man. We're talking Indians as rightfully so, because they have really, uh, really come together strong here. We talked about how they ended the homestand, and I'm going to start, but instead of just talking about last night's game, about saying, Mike, I've been waiting all day to talk to you, because we've been rat a tat between the two of us about stop comparing to last year and, and, and all of that, but man... Here they sit, identical record, 60 games in from last year, and they got there, even though they got there in the opposite way, they were getting cold at this time last year instead of getting hot like they are now. They did it in very similar ways for the most part, with the exception of the defense, and I think that they're going to continue, as much as you don't want to hear it, to follow a lot of the same things that we saw from this team last year, because at the end of the day, it might not be last year's team, but a lot of it is, and, and really, that's not going to go away. But here they sit, all the ups and downs of the first two months, here they sit exactly where they were last year. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, you know, and I'm one, I, I think every season lives in its own nutshell. But while we're comparing, I, I think you are, you know, spot on. And I think as long as this season goes, and if you look at the first 60 games, I mean, there are how they got here is a little bit of a different route, but the commonalities from last year and this year are definitely similar. And I mean, how they got to thirty and thirty is, you know, really dependent on a couple things. And the biggest one, in my mind, is pitching. And you know, they didn't get good pitching for a long time. And if you look at, you know, the last couple weeks, they've started to get better starting pitching. And I mean, you look at this year. Um, you know, you have some, some bullpen issues in the beginning with John Axford and, you know, some of those have started to work themselves out. Um, you know, you have a starting rotation that is three-fifths different than it was on opening day, at least right now. 
until McAllister's back. Um, yep. and, you, and you think that some of those issues are getting worked out. I mean, certainly Trevor Bauer and Josh Tomlin have stepped in and given much, much better efforts than Danny Salazar and Carlos Carrasco were. And so, you know, I, I agree with you. You're maybe the route to 30 and 30 is a little different, but, um, you know, the, the things that add up to it are all the same. And I think, you know, consistent starting pitching is one of those keys that, you know, is never going to go away. And when they get it, they're in it. And when they don't, you know, they're not. Man, Dan Wismar yesterday made a hell of a point, and you touched on a little bit of it right there when he said, Jerry, just look at, uh, just imagine at the beginning of the season, if I would have called you and said, hey, uh, the Indians are going to turn over 60% of their starting rotation. They're going to, closure's going to be flamed out of his job within the first, you know, month of the season. Uh, you know, these guys combined are going to be hitting, you know, 190. He went through the whole, the whole gamut. They're going to give up an error a game and an earned run a game, et cetera, and so forth. He goes, what do you think their record would be? Because, and we've said that kind of incrementally as we've gone along, that it was a testament to these guys, but it is like, I mean, three fifths of your starting rotation flipped over that really is the key those guys beginning to settle in and you know what along those lines i noticed that you uh at did the try win last night.com i noticed you guys did an article the other day and I, I was looking forward to talking to you about that about kind of fixing or whatever justin masterson and what's been wrong with him because that i think is the next target of of getting straight in the rotation is getting Masty going and, and being able to solidify him so that we can continue to lock this rotation in place and get consistent starting pitching con- throughout, not just one run, but throughout each run of the rotation. Yeah, I think you're right. And I mean, I think, you know, me at this point, I don't get too high on the highs and I don't try to get too low on the lows. So, I mean, I'm, I'm excited to see him play better, play better and, and pitch better. Um, over the last couple weeks, but, you know, I would say I've guarded optimism like I normally do. Um, and Justin Masterson, you know, I mean, he's a prime example of that. He had a great game this week, um, but it's one game. And I think there are real reasons to be concerned. His numbers are not the same. Um, and the two biggest things that we brought up in that column on Monday is his velocity has dropped. I mean, what I would consider to be dramatically um over the last three years, his fastball velocity, according to fan graphs, has dropped 3.7 miles per hour from 2011 to now. And that is, that is something that I think is considerably concerning yeah. um, for a guy who is still only 30 years old. Um, and, and along with the drop in velocity, um, this year has you know also been a drop in accuracy. And so... Um, you know, his, his walks are going up and the velocity is going down and that does not make a good Justin Masterson and something has to change. And, you know, I kind of tried to speculate in the column, um, you know, if there's some kind of pressure of being in a walk year that he's in, I'm not sure that that's necessarily the guy you want to invest in. And I'm not saying that the Indians have made the right decision to not extend him. And I'm not saying they should walk away from him, but something's not right with the guy. And hopefully these two months are really just a blip on the radar. And by the end of the year, um, you know, this is all gone away. But if the game the other night on Monday night turns out to be the blip on the radar, you know, the Indians may have sidestepped an opportunity to, you know, not get deep into Justin Masterson for big money. And maybe that won't be as bad as what we all first thought in February and March when talks broke off. Absolutely, you know, and, and I'm just curious, what are your thoughts? Because we've had some listeners ask, and I, I've been kind of stalling off. I said, hey, I, I mean, I think if anything like this is going to happen, it would be the all-star break because when most teams do this, do you do you think, it? let's say things uh, kind of stay the way they've gone in the first half here and, and with the starting rotation, do you see a reshuffling perhaps of the order um, as far as perhaps even moving Corey Kluber to that number one spot and rearranging the guys here going into the set. Because I, I think if that's going to happen, it would happen. You would redo your rotation coming out of the all-star break. That's whenever teams do that. I think that's one spot that they use. But had a lot of people say, oh, man, well, what do you think, man? Do you do you switch Masterson and Kluber? Do you want him up at the top? I say, yeah, but not yet. What do you think? Yeah, I'd, 
if they're going to do that, it's at the all-star break. And, right. you know, there's a lot of variables that go into that. And, and I'll say before, I guess I break a couple of them down, as long as they're pitching every fifth day, I'm not sure that it really matters who goes in what order. But, I mean, truthfully, at this point, you know, to kind of play a little bit with your scenario, if Corey Kluber continues to pitch the way that he has, he's probably pitching himself right on to the American League All-Star team. I and agree. if he does that, and if he does that, you know, I'm not sure that he starts that first game after the All-Star break because he very possibly pitches, you know, on Tuesday night in the All-Star game. And so, you know, again, if, if nothing really changes in the next six weeks between now and then, you might go with Justin Masterson out of the break because he's not going to be an all-star. Um, and you look at some of the other guys, I think, you know, what Josh Tomlin has done, you know, your guy has been as reliable as anybody since he's come up. I mean, you know, oh, yeah. every time that guy takes the ball, you're getting six innings and a chance to win. And Trevor Bauer has become more and more the guy that they traded for in December of 2012 and not the guy that was walking people all over the place and, having mechanical issues in 2013. So, I mean, if, if you want to get real crazy, I mean, and that was part of the, what I touched on in the Masterson story, I mean, I think you can make a case, at least in the here and now, for the short term, Justin Masterson might be your fourth best starter, you know, today on June 5th. Um, if things stay status quo, you know, I think Kluber is your best guy moving forward. Um, if he's an all-star, you know, maybe when that rotation is reshuffled, you know, maybe he's not in the one spot coming out of the break because he pitches on Tuesday night, but maybe it's still not Justin Masterson. I mean, maybe it's one of those other guys and Masterson shuffles in there somewhere, you know, ahead of or behind Kluber, depending on, you know, where he fits in the all-star game. And I, I think that's a great point, too, because I think he's playing his way into being an all-star there, too. I think there's a couple other guys, too. Everybody talks about Michael Brantley. I think there's a few of them. We'll talk about that in a minute, but we're talking about the pitching, so I want to stick there because talking about these guys that have filled gaps, a couple of the other guys that they've replaced. I mean, Danny Salazar, haven't really talked about it at all on the show here, but uh, things have gone from bad to worse for Danny Salazar since he was demoted from the Major League team. I mean, look at what he's gone through. He had a bad stretch down uh, once he went down, and now he's on the shelf. He's got a strained tricep. He's on the disabled list down at AAA. Talk to me a little bit about the uh, last month or so here ending up on the DL for Danny Salazar. Comparing 2013 to 2014, it's like Trevor Bauer and Danny Salazar traded bodies. I, I know. Mean, you could al- I mean, you could almost, you know, Trevor Bauer 2013 has become Danny Salazar 2014. And, you know, I think some of Salazar's issues are mechanical. I know at one point, I think it was Mickey Callaway made the statement that you know, he's trying to throw his fastball by everyone to solve his problems, and you can't you can't do that at the big league level. And, you know, I think when you do that, sometimes when you overthrow, you create mechanical issues there, and, and that also leads to injuries, and, and that's where he's at now. And I don't want to be the guy that says, I told you so in any way, but, you know, I always felt, and I know we talked about this throughout the winter, Jerry, but I always felt not necessarily that they needed to go out and re-sign Ubaldo or Scott Casimir, but I always thought it was a mistake and unfair of the Indians to assume that their loss of two-fifths of their rotation from last year was okay because they had Danny Salazar. And that was very clear, the mentality, several times throughout the winter. And, you know, I just think it's it's a big role to count on a 22-, 23-year-old kid for that. And several times I said, but well, what if it doesn't work? The guy's only made 10 starts, and it hasn't worked. And I think, you know, no one's jumping off the Danny Salazar train, you know, long term. I think I think any anyone that has followed him knows that, you know, the potential is still very high. But at this point, between his early issues and his now, you know, injury, I think counting on him for 2014 for anything is as wild of a wild card as it's ever been. I mean, I don't think you can bank on him 
for the last 100 games for anything. If you get something, it's a bonus. No, I think you're right. Not even looking at the performance, just the injury itself. And right now it's been categorized as a strained tricep muscle. But, I mean, I'm thinking what? Best case, and you tell me if I'm off here. Best case scenario, you get him back by the beginning of June. I mean, you got to think – you got to think you're looking at a, at a four to six week type of rehab. At least what I know of triceps, and and that's without a tear. That's just with a with it being a strain. But is that the same time frame that you're hearing too for him to begin to get back on the field? Yeah, I would think you're looking at at least a month. And obviously, I mean, as far as him potentially helping the big league team, I mean, if he misses a month and he doesn't come back until you know early to mid July. I think he's going to have to prove himself at least for a month and then have an opening in the rotation somewhere. I mean, I would say at earliest, you know, you're looking somewhere in August before he really surfaces on the radar as a guy that can make a difference on this on this big league roster. And, and that's probably giving him the benefit of the doubt. I mean, that's probably best case scenario. So, uh, I mean, that kind of goes back to, I wouldn't, I wouldn't bank on him for anything for this year. If if he comes back and he is ready to go and does provide a contribution down the stretch, I mean, I think at this point, you know, that's a bonus. But I don't think you can count on Danny Salazar in 2014 for for a lot. You know what's funny is a lot of people, it's like kind of like sight unseen to the casual fan when a guy goes down to AAA. It's just kind of like this netherworld that they disappear to and then they resurface because a lot of people that I've talked to over the last few days, no clue that Danny Salazar yep. is even injured. Like, they're just, you know, a, you know, hey, Salazar, come back and help. I'm like, hey, Salazar may not come back and do a lot this season because he's banged. I mean, this is – and I, we're talking about a muscle injury in the arm of a pitcher. You know what I'm saying? So um, it's definitely a slippery slope there and how long till he comes back. But I, I just find it funny how many people don't even realize uh, that he that he's – got jacked up since he went down there not only it good that he went down there because he was he was definitely on a down from the performance side now instead of the injury not looking good at all since he was sent down to begin with well and, and that i think was a lot was confidence of being shook up from being sent down after being you know the quick rise up but the performance wasn't good as it was and then you know now to just top it off with this and the other guy i wanted to talk about talking about that is McAllister. am i wrong i believe he got washed washed out again. I think he's missed his last, both of his shots at a rehab uh, appearance. Am I wrong? I don't think he's been able to get out there yet because of weather. Right. And I think, um, he, he definitely was washed out last night. Um, he was supposed to pitch at Lake County. And I think, I don't want to swear to this, but I believe he is pitching tonight at Lake County. Um, and I, I also think that they are, at this point, looking at at least one more rehab start after that. So I would not be surprised if uh, and if a start tonight in Lake County leads to another one, possibly in Akron or Columbus, before returning. So, I mean, if you're counting the seconds until Zach McAllister returns, I mean, I would say your your calendar probably is at least 10 days still. If he starts tonight and you go five more and he starts again, I mean, he's gonna, you're going to have five days on the flip side of that second start before he's activated and ready to pitch for the Indians. So, you know, still a little bit. What do you think? Just I think you and I talked about this a couple of weeks ago. You were right on the head about him going to the DL when he was struggling there. How much of his struggles during that, that rough stretch right before he went on the DL, how much of that do you attribute to the injury? Do you think he's going to be able to get himself back to the way he was in the early portion of the season? I would say this is kind of one of those chicken or the egg, uh, you know, scenarios. Is he... Was he struggling because he was injured, or is he injured because he's struggling? Uh Um, You know, guys get hurt, and I kind of use that in quotation marks. Guys get hurt all the time. Um, You know, and I think we know Jason Giambi has a back issue whenever the roster gets into a crunch. (laughs) Exactly. It's It's quite interesting that Zach McAllister had a back issue when they needed a starter the next day. and. And look, you know, I'm not, teams do this all the time. You know, I'm not accusing the Indians or anyone of any kind of 
fuzzy business or anything, but, you know, I think in a, in a number of ways, you know, if you look at McAllister and you look at Carlos Santana and you look at Nick Swisher, it's an opportunity for all those guys to kind of hit the reset button on their season. I'm not saying that I think after 60 games, everybody has some kind of ache, pain, nagging injury. And when things aren't going for going well for you on the mound or at the plate, and you have one of those injuries, you know, I think the Indians are definitely erring on the side of caution with all of them and, you know, taking the opportunity to hit the reset button on all those guys. And, and I don't think that's a bad thing. Um, you know, if, if you hit the reset on McAllister and he comes back and he's the Zach McAllister that, that they had last year or that they had in April of this year, I mean, don't forget in April, he was, he was the Corey Kluber of yeah, right now. I mean, he absolutely. was their best pitcher in April. So if you can hit the, hit the reset button on those guys, you know, then, then we start making more comparisons to this team, to last year's team and their second half. And, and hopefully that's the case. I agree with you there too, man. You know, that three and O start, uh, it, it, definitely you want to get him back along there. I think he's going to be keeping at the same time. I think it's cool that you got a little bit more of a window here because you're going to get to see at least one or two more starts, you know, out of TJ house and Bauer. You got time here to see how this is going to shake out before you start making those decisions. Cause it's before you joined us, Bruce was on the phone called in and we were talking Along those lines, but instead of as a pitching, talking about, you know, those decisions over the next 7 to 10 to 14 days when you have Santana coming back in the mix and Swisher, but the team is playing well in the meantime, you want to find guys time. You got to keep finding places to play Lonnie Chisenhall and and all of that. And, you know, those decisions are going to get tougher here in the next two weeks because, do you ride the hot hand or do you try to put everybody back where they were before they got hurt? But I mean, clearly this team, and I'm not in any way saying it's because of those guys, Santana and and Swisher not being there, but they're clearly playing well right now. So those decisions start to get tricky here real quick. Yeah, I agree. And you know, I'm with you. I don't think that they're playing better because they're without those guys. But I do think they're playing better because they have two guys that are hitting 200 or below out of their lineup. Uh, yeah. And, and, you know, offensively, this is a much better offense than it was 10 days ago when those two guys were in it. And, you know, in some regard, it's not an accident. Um, you know, and, and I think that kind of goes back to the, you know, hitting the reset button, as I called it. If you get those guys reset and, and they're the guys – that we've grown to accept and expect, then the offense continues to be the machine that it's been. Um, if they come back and they're 200 hitters still, I mean, at some point you got to entertain that they don't play every single day. I mean, realistically, you're not putting those guys on the bench. Um, but, you know, you got to start to question if they're not getting it done. You know, what What moves do you have to make? I'll give you one. Last night, I was at some of that marathon. I will not pretend that I was there to the end. Because <laughs> I still, still have to be a functioning adult today. So I was definitely not there at the end. But I did sit through the entire rain delay in about the first five or six innings. And I was with one of our other writers, Steve Eby. And so we had a good four to five hours to kill there. And one of the things that he brought up, and he said, look at every position player on the roster right now and then take Santana and Swisher and taking where they play on the field out of it. If you were just ranking them, not just with Nick Swisher not be one of your nine best ball players, he might not be better than anyone except for Jason Giambi. And I tried, and when he said that, I thought that can't be possible. And I started working, you know, mentally through the roster. And the only one that I could even entertain as a possibility to say that he was wrong was maybe Ryan Rayburn. And after that, I mean, ask yourself, if you, if you needed a hit to win a game or to tie a game, I think you'd send every guy to the plate. 
<laughs> before bro Ohio. Am, am I wrong? <laughs> no, I. you know what? When you put it in that isolated and you look at it like that, I'm with you. Like, uh, I hear you. If you needed a hit, I, and I could even see people that make the, the, the Rayburn or Giambi, they, they pinch hit well. So you can make that argument. Right. That you oh, sure. You, you could, a, you could a, argue on their behalf. I yeah. mean, I'm, I'm giving them the be- I'm giving Swisher the benefit of the doubt at this point. You know, I'm just saying You're they're right though, man. they're in the argument. But I mean, that was Steve's case to me, and I I kind of had one of those oh man, you know, you know, wow, this this is not good. Um, but you know, to kind of go with what you said, you know, if those guys come back and they don't produce, I mean, even even with that, before you give those guys a chance to produce. I don't know how you take Lonnie Chisholm Hall out of the lineup now. You can't. I mean, that guy, I, I mean, there's no way. And I don't care if it's at the expense of Swisher or Santana or anyone else. I mean, the guy's hitting 370. He's hitting lefties. Um, you know, you got to put that guy in the lineup. And I guess that means, you know, Mike Avilas has been playing, you know, most days. Some of, some of his time will get minimized when Santana or Swisher comes back. But, you know, I, if those guys don't produce, I mean, I don't know how Lonnie Chisholm doesn't continue to play every day. I mean, I think he has played his way into the lineup to where he he deserves the right to control his own destiny. And as long as he produces, he should be in there every day. And whether it's at third or whether it's at first, um, part of me hates the idea that, you know, this team is so bad defensively and we keep changing people's positions. But in the same breath, He's played fairly well at first base, and I'm the guy that always says it's not like he's Brooks Robinson over there at third. And and to, <laughs> to say the same, it's not like Nick Swisher's Don Mattingly either yeah, at no. first. So, you know, if Lonnie Chisholm Hall becomes your best option at first base, I'm A-OK with that. And if he's, you know, offensively at this point, I mean, if you're going to get bad defense at third base with Chisholm Hall or Santana, Get you know, I'll take the guy that's hitting 370 over the guy hitting 170. Brother, not only can you not make an argument to keep him out of the lineup every day with Chisenhall, you're very quickly people are going to start making all star arguments about about him if he has another two or three weeks that matches what he's done so far. Very quickly, it's going to go from just "Hey, Michael Brantley" to "What about Lonnie Chisenhall?" and of course Corey Kluber. And and I'll go so far, and this fits right into what you said about kind of hitting the reset button on guys. Doesn't it feel kind of like that worked in the case of Michael Bourne? He got himself I knew, right. I he knew you were going to mention him. You know it. You know it. He and, got himself healthy, and now he's looking and cooking like what you thought you were going to get and what you want out of the leadoff hitter. In, in our five-hour conversation yesterday that Steve and I had at the Indians game, I made mention that I've written – uh, three, I'm not even sure that they're negative, but truthful stories, um, you know, that maybe necessarily weren't positive about guys. You know, I wrote a story as the season started about Chisholm Hall and that I didn't think he really fit on this roster long term. Um, I wrote a story about a month ago about Michael Bourne, and I wrote a story this week about Justin Masterson. And, you know, the, that night Masterson comes out and without doubt pitches his best game of the year. <laughs> and I said, you know, I should just, you know, roast a player every Monday morning, and yeah. this team will be the best team in baseball by August at the, at the clip that I'm working. So I don't know, maybe I should try to do a dual column for Santana and Swisher next week and, and we'll solve all our problems. But, I mean, I think you're right. Um, you know, Bourne is, for all the things I actually think until, you know, the last, you know, three, four weeks, I've actually said, you know, off the air, I think Bourne is a guy who has not got as much criticism as he deserves. Um, he should yes. have been criticized more for, I think he's let down the offense. And, I think what he's done in the last month is exactly what the Indians signed up for in a guy that, you know, he is he is starting it at the top. He is running the bases for the first time and making plays. He's a guy that, you know, pitchers and catchers are now paying attention to because he's running, and he is opening everything up for as Drupal Cabrera and Michael Brantley and Jason Kipnis behind him. And, you know, I, I've all I've said several times, you know, I feel like when they signed him, it was with the hope that he would be, 
you know, they're Kenny Lofton or Kenny Lofton light at least. And he hasn't been until the last month. And what he's done in the month of May, you see him be that Kenny Lofton type guy and you see the impact it's made on this offense in the last two weeks. I mean, everything's changing and I don't think it's an accident. I think a lot of it has to do with his improved play. I agree, and I said I've said it for the last week or so. I said this is the first time since they signed him. This is they that they're getting the guy that they thought when they made that commitment to him. And a caller made a point the other day to what you said. Let's look past his bat or any of that. Look, just watching the ground churn underneath his feet lately as he runs. You can see a different running, a different strength in his running, his confidence. Like, it, it's it's like you said, it's that what you thought you were going to get. Kenny Lofton light, that's a good way to put it. But just seeing the ground churn underneath his feet as he's running and seeing him kick up that dirt and really be aggressive and be able to. And I think maybe, and I know you know you might say I'm giving him too much credit here with this, but I think some of it too, not just this year, but I think he came in, and maybe I'm way off with this, but he's one of those guys that signed later because he was, you know, the we know the whole situation with the, with the qualifying offer and everything. But I just think uh, maybe he didn't come in injured, but I don't think he came in like you should, whatever reason. I don't think he was ever right. And then we saw him get banged up at the end of the season and then beginning of this one. And I think for the first time, he's not injured at all. He's just playing baseball and he's finally being the guy that you thought you got when you, when you did this. Yeah, I think you're right. And I think there's a lot to it. And I could do the rest of your show just talking about the qualifying offer. And I think... <laughs> After two years of seeing it from both the players and the team's point of view, um, I think you will see both entities proceed much differently in the future. Um, I think if you are not a top, top, top tier player, if you're not Robinson Cano, I mean, as an example from last year, a qualifying offer makes no difference. You're, you're, not, you're not worried about giving up the first round draft pick if you're signing Robinson Cano. But I think if if you're a player who gets the qualifying offer placed on you, I think you have to start to become more serious about thinking about accepting that offer at times. And you look at a guy like Bourne, I mean, there's a number of examples of guys that will, I think, make make other guys in the future really consider about accepting that, that qualifying offer. And I think... You know, Bourne is a good example because I think it has it has affected him last year. Um, he came in just a little late to camp. I think it's not a secret. He played a lot of the year somewhat injured. And then he started in that injury from last year, I mean, in some ways, carried over to the beginning of this year. And, you know, it all kind of goes back to that. And I think from a team standpoint, I think there's some guys you're going to have to start being careful to put qualifying offers on because they're going to accept and you're going to have to ask yourself, now what am I going to do with this guy now that I'm committed $14, $15 million to him for another year? I agree. I'm, I'm, I'm with you, man. And I'm glad that you see that too. Cause I, I'm looking, just looking at that. And I, I said it yesterday, me and Dan were talking about it a little bit. Uh, Dan Wismar and I, and I said, uh, I said, man, I said, I know that guys do their own training and all that stuff, but I said, it can't be the same. There's no way sitting at the house, not sure where you're going to go, when you're going to sign. Other guys are already reporting all this other stuff. There's just no way unless you are that super self-motivated, that really rare, rare self-motivated athlete. There's no way your preparation from the get-go is where a, a player who was on a roster, who was being prepped, plus the teams that all have their off-season regiments and the different things, they're kind of directing you to get you ready for spring so then they can bring you in and get you ready for the season. And I think no matter how much self-prep you do, I think that sets you behind from the beginning. And like you said, we saw it, especially when you're a guy, your legs are, your, are really what carries you, whether it's defensively, across the bases, whatever, and those, the legs are the easiest thing to go, you know, underneath you, 
when you're not training a peak and, and ready. And I think that we saw it. You said it, man. And I think that that just affected him all year and it has carried over and the hammy at the end of the season. And then again, at the beginning of this season and all of that. And finally, for once he's, he's got himself back, but you're right. Especially if, if we see it and, and, and other people see it, then, you know, players see it. And that's a hell of a point. You just made that guys will point fingers at a guy like Michael Bourne and these other guys and go, look, man, I would rather take the money and and not lose a year or set myself back 15 months or something uh, just being difficult. I'll take the $14 million and I'll work on this again next year, this whole free agency thing, you know? Right. I'll give you two examples since we're heading down this road. The first one, I think, you know, hindsight's always twenty twenty, But at the time, I thought they should have considered strongly – giving Scott Casimir the qualifying offer. And, of course, it looks like a great deal now. Yeah, it does. Should, yeah, it does. You know, I, I mean, so, of course, I, I mean, I don't want to sit here and, and sound like I'm Nostradamus here predicting, you know, predicting the past when we when we all know now that it's an easy decision. But if you think about it, if you would have given him the, off, the qualifying offer, you know, the Indians were hesitant to go two years or longer. They didn't want to commit to a long-term deal with, with Casimir for all of his injuries and his comeback. And I understand all of that. I think that makes perfect sense for the Indians. But let's say they give him the qualifying offer last winter. If they would have given him the qualifying offer, they probably would have overpaid for him a little bit if he would have accepted. First of all, he probably wouldn't because no one has yet. So if he would have accepted, they would have paid a little bit more than what Oakland did at 11 per but they would have basically paid the extra $3 million to not have to sign him long term. I think there's value in that. And then on the other side, had he not accepted, you know, if anything, he declines the qualifying offer like I think he would have. He pro- he's one of those guys that his value would have been driven down on, on the open market because now you have to sign that guy and you have to give up a first-round draft pick with all the question marks that are tagged to him the Indians may have been able to re-sign him for a one-year deal after he declined the qualifying offer, maybe at a cheaper rate than what Oakland even did at $11 million. I mean, I think that that's one mistake, yeah. you know, they'll never admit to. But I think, you know, in, in hindsight, I mean, they have to have thought now, man, we should have given that guy a qualifying offer. And the another one that I'll give you for the future a year ago, I would have said it's a guarantee slam dunk that at the end of 2014, the Indians will give as Dribble Cabrera the qualifying offer. I think and you I'm did not say sure that, that they will I think anymore. I think I mean, you said that here over you, the winter. You might have even said that you saw that coming. I mean, do you want to run the risk of him accepting <laughs> a one-year deal and the qualifying offer will be over $15 it's gonna go million? Up. Dollars yeah, it's going to be like 15 So are you willing right? to... to have him accept a one-year, fifteen million dollar deal when everybody and their brother knows that Francisco Lindor is ready to be your opening day shortstop in 2015. You know what will fifteen additional million dollars on the Indians' payroll, who's financially strapped as it is? What's that going to do to help the rest of the team? Not to mention that you might not even have a place to play the guy. I mean, we're, we just got done talking about Lonnie Chisholm Hall and, you know, what are they going to do with Carlos Santana? You know, moving forward, there's not room at the end for Asdrubal Cabrera, and I think <laughs> everybody involved knows that. But do you think Asdrubal Cabrera is getting $15 million on the open market? I don't. So if he has another mediocre year... But let me ask you. Put the, let me just they put the down. franchise tag on him. He might be the first guy that accepts, because why wouldn't he? Not from the Indians' perspective, but from as Drupal, as a play devil's advocate, let's just say that he gets his season going because we have seen some some signs of life from him here uh, offensively and a little bit defensively. Let's just say that he has a hot second half of the season. He gets warmed up heading into June and July, and he plays, let's say, at the level you know you expected if you thought he was going to have a halfway decent season this year. Not on the Indian side, but then what kind of interest? Because I think I think just a hot. We've seen a guy ride. We saw Ubaldo ride a hot second half of a season, three quarters of a season to a contract. I mean, I think clearly 
he that's all it would take in my opinion for as Drupal to re uh, ignite other people's willingness to spend money on him it's possible but that qualifying offer it weighs heavy Jerry I, yeah. I agree oh, yeah. with you I mean I think you know he'll have a market um, for sure if he turns his season around I, I think he'll have a market if he doesn't I mean if he hits yeah you're 240, right. 250. I mean, Johnny Peralta got busted for yeah, PEDs yeah, he missed 50 games and, yep. and got a boatload of money. So, I mean, I, I don't think we're going to have to pick up a collection for <laughs> Drupal Cabrera. No. Don't get me wrong. I mean, you know, I, I don't think we have to worry about him becoming a hardship case. That's for sure. No. Um, but but I would say, you know, if he's a guy, I mean, look at the struggles that Ubaldo had to get signed a look at the struggles that Irvin Santana had. And, you know, those guys are pitchers. Everybody's dying for pitching. Um, you can find hitters, you know, you know, a little more easily. Um, and I don't think it's coincidence, you know, Stephen Drew went into this year without a deal, and he's a shortstop. So, you know, I'm not sure that I, I see where you're going, but I'm not sure if you put the qualifying offer on him and he declines it, and that's tied to him. He's got, at this point, you know, two poor years in 2012 and 2013, and he's starting to work on a third one. I mean, he really hasn't played at an all-star level since the first half of 2012. Um, are you willing to give that guy a contract, you know, a long-term deal if you're if you're another team and a draft pick? I mean, I can see him, you know, kind of falling into the Ubaldo zone there where, He's going to go deep into the winter. He'll be a guy like Ubaldo or like Michael Bourne where he's going to be looking for a job. And if that happens, I mean, that's where I go back to some of those guys who, you know, get the qualifying offer placed on them. I think you're going to see guys in the future more and more start to think about, you know, one year for $15 million doesn't look so bad. Yeah, absolutely. You know, that's going to be something to watch because I'm – I don't know, maybe it's because I predicted success for him, but I'm looking for a good second half out of his Drupal. I really do. I think he's going to warm up and get going uh, as a combination of him getting going anyway and the uh, the fact that I think the contract and all of that stuff, but I'm looking for him to do better. Hey, last thing before I let you go that I want to talk about is, you know, we're feeling good right now and, uh, you know, sitting at 500, coming off a good homestand, and now what a good time to get that kind of feel-good momentum going because you head out on your longest road trip of the season. You've got four at Texas and back-end four at Boston, who's definitely going to be itching to make up for this sweep here when they welcome you, sandwiched a couple at Kansas City in the middle. So a a tough 10-game road trip here coming up for the Indians. Talk to me a little bit about what you think uh, heading into this. Obviously, starts tomorrow with you, Darvish, and Texas. Yeah, I think, you know, this is, a, I mean, again, kind of comparing this team to last year, I mean, they're very much the same, you know, team streak as they were a year ago. Um, and I think at this point it's not a secret that they've really played poorly this year on the road. But if they're going to turn this season around, if they're going to continue the turnaround um, in the upward swing and, you know, now only three and a half back at Detroit and you get to 500, I think you can legitimately start to talk about, you know, trying to win the division again. Oh, yeah. You got to come out and play well on this road trip. Um, I mean, one, from a sense, you can't be the worst team on the road in baseball or in the American League um, like they have been. But also, you look at the three teams that they're playing on the road, they're all struggling or lukewarm at best. I mean, Texas is kind of trying to stay alive. And like you said, you know, you're going to see you Darvish tomorrow, but. I mean, if Texas didn't have bad luck, they'd have no luck at all this year. I mean, when it comes to to injuries and the injury front, and that's a team that, you know, I think the Indians are benefiting that they're playing them in early June in Texas and not in July or August. Hey, real quick, just let me just... To pause where you're at because you're going to keep going with that. But let me just pause while you're talking about that. We I don't think we've even had a chance to mention you and I anyway. Uh, looking at Prince Fielder and that, and look at how that played out for Texas. Talking about things going wrong and injuries and all of that. I mean, clearly 
that we talked in the off season about that swap and Kinsler and Fielder and all of that, and uh, definitely has not played out the way they anticipated at all in Texas. Yeah, it, I mean their their season's a disaster, and I mean most of it's just on um, bad luck and injuries. Yeah. Um, you know what what are you going to do? So you, I mean you have that series, and you go to Kansas City. That's a team that's kind of starting to free fall there, and you know don't be surprised if the fire sale goes up you know, in another month or six weeks with that team, if if they're not going to re-sign James Shields, and I don't think they will, you know, you start, you know, that's a guy, the qualifying offer is not going to matter. They're going to sign, somebody's going to sign him, and, and if Kansas City can can get, you know, a good deal for him and they continue to fall, you know, they have to think about dealing him at the deadline and giving up, you know, their qualifying offer rights, so and making a deal for a prospect or two and, you know, maybe rerouting that organization. And then you finish in Boston. And, you know, again, if you're, you know, they're very much, you know, the same formula as the Indians right now and that they've had some ups and downs and they haven't been themselves from last year. And, you know, I think that's another team that, you know, you want to take advantage of right now while, while they're kind of in that, I would say, stuck in neutral. Yeah. And you know what? Going a step further, and I'm definitely not looking past this road trip, but uh, like just looking at some interesting storylines on the back end when you come back home, you got two intriguing series because, you know, you got the Angels. First time we've seen them since they smacked the Indians around across on the West Coast. So you've got the revenge factor there. And then Detroit returns to the scene of the crime, the series that kind of really got this uh, momentum rolling at home for the Indians as they return back for the first time since they were swept in Cleveland. So interesting uh, on the back end of the road trip with what they've got when they get back home, too. Yeah, and, you know, I mean, look at how, you know, as the world turns, how many ups and downs this season's had in 60 games. <laughs> I mean, the Indians, could, the Indians could be up three or four games on Detroit by the time the Tigers get here for that series, or they could be back to, you know, seven, eight back again. But you have to think at this point that, you know, that's going to be a, a, a series of probably and hopefully many, you know, down the stretch that are going to kind of be heavyweight bouts for this division. Yeah, how many times does Detroit have a 16-game stretch where they go 4-12, and 12, you know, and the Indians have been able to take advantage of that and chop, as you just said, seven games off of the uh, deficit there in a matter of a couple of weeks. That's uh, that's big. I'm looking forward to that series. You know what, too? Bruce in the chat room uh, mentioned you had brought up earlier uh, mentioning about, uh, you know, getting better on the road. He found this. Bruce finds these stats, man. Three teams in history have won a division title while having a under 500 road record for the season. So a uh, very, very small sample of, of teams that have been successful doing it the hard way on the road. So it behooves the Indians to start winning some games on the road. But I'm I'm kind of surprised that three teams have actually done it over the years. I don't know what the teams are, but three teams have been sub-500 on the road and still won their division. But not the ideal path you want to go. <laughs> yeah, I don't make life difficult on yourself and that's I think not. that's one of those if you look hard enough you can find a statistic for anything absolutely my man Mike Brandenberry from did the tribe win last night.com always a great time talking to you and uh, especially today coming off of a really good homestand for the Indians and let's see now what they can do starting tomorrow and hopefully they can as we said not just play well on the road but take advantage of the timeliness of meeting some of these teams while they also uh, are having trouble getting their legs out from underneath them too and uh, it'll be a lot of fun let's see by the time you and I talk again we'll be through Texas and Kansas the city and heading to Boston to take on the Red Sox. So uh, we'll have a good sample of the beginning of this road trip behind us to talk about next week. Sounds good. My summer vacation officially begins on Saturday. So uh, anytime you need me, uh, you only have to compete with babysitting and golfing for about the next uh, 10, 12 weeks. So let me know anytime. It. And I'll take advantage of that, man. You, we'll, we'll, we'll work some things out. We'll make it a couple days a week, man. I'm looking forward to it. It'll be, I think it's going to be a fun summer, man. I'm looking forward to it and uh, having you even more on the show. So that sounds great. Sounds good. All right. Mike Brandenberry from Did the Tribe Win Last Night dot com. You guys can check him out there. And, and, and those are uh, some of the uh, articles we were referencing that they've written this week. That's where you can find them. Did the Tribe Win Last Night dot com. Just spell it out. 
punch it up in the browser. We're going to take a break. When we come back, speaking of punching, ding, ding, ding. Come on out from your corners here. The NBA Finals is set. We're going to talk about that. I'll talk about some of the interesting stuff I, I mentioned that I uncovered here, talking about LeBron heading into the Finals. And we'll set the stage tonight. Heat and the Spurs get at it as we finish up the day. <laughs> it's not over yet, baby. NBA Finals preview coming up next live here on the Sports Fix. A public service announcement from the Sports Fix. We here at the Sports Fix and our affiliates would like to apologize for any disturbing verbal actions, but remember, it's better having them trapped in a box than loose on the streets. Public service announcement from the Sports Fix. The Sports Fix. The sports show that cares. Guys, want to take just a second as we head into this break and remind you about the official business printing source of the Sports Fix, our friends at Signs and Ship. Signs and Ship, I'm telling you, Chris and Pam, they've taken care of me since day one, and they can do the same for you. Whether you're a small business that's already been established and you're looking to grow to that next level and expand your business, or perhaps you've got an idea that you just know is going to be a great business and you need to figure out how to brand it and how to promote it and put it out there, Signs and Ship is the place for you. If you need a logo, they can create one for you. They have a fantastic graphic designer. Business cards, signs, banners, yard signs, mobile advertising, anything you can think of that you need to promote your business, they've got it at Signs and Ship. The best thing about them, too, is each of their locations, whether it's the home base here in Elyria, Ohio that I work with, or their spots in Virginia, Florida, and Pennsylvania. It's all local sourced. Very important to me because we all understand that small business is the lifeblood of the community. So check them out, signsandship.com, or call Chris and Pam today, 440-323-6060, the home office in Elyria, Ohio. Signs and Ship, quality printing at affordable prices. It's the Sports Fix. We'll be right back. Indians fans, GV Art and Design has unleashed their new baseball collection. This summer, you've got to have one of the hottest baseball shirts available. Indians themed GV Art has them covered from top to bottom. Chief Wahoo, keep the Chief, one of the hottest sellers going today. GV Art were knocking it out of the park, teaming up with Michael Brantley to create a custom Dr. Smooth t-shirt, bringing back an old classic GV artwork, bringing out the wild thing. Give them the heater design. The Cleveland That I Glove collection continues to grow. New designs for women and so much more. GVArtwork.com bringing it full force to the plate for baseball season this year. Whether you check them out online, GVArtwork.com. Use the sales code FIX10, FIX10 to save 10% on your total purchase. Whether you go to their store in Lakewood, check them out at the Cleveland Indians, team shops around Progressive Field, and so much more. GV Art and Design. It's It's not just just a shirt. shirt. It's a statement. Sports Fix listeners, like us on Facebook today. Facebook.com slash the Sports Fix. I've been a pro wrestler my whole life, so championship belts have always kind of been a way of life to me. But did you know title belts are quickly becoming the fastest rising and the most popular new way for people to celebrate all kinds of things you never would have thought of before? We use it for our Fantasy Football League. It's a really cool conversation piece. Office pools, employee of the month, you name it. There's tons of different trophies that you used to buy plaques for. Well, I'm here to tell you about Pro-Am Championship Belts, who have the highest quality championship belt with the lowest price. Replace those old trophies with stock belts on hand that they can customize for as low as $30. Any occasion, celebrations, awards, championships, fantasy leagues, gifts, plus wrestling, mixed martial arts, boxing. If you need championship belts, check them out. Pro-Am Championship Belts. ProAmBelts.com. Look them up on Facebook. Pro-Am Belts. Trust me, nothing says cool like doing the discount double check with a real championship belt. Just ask Aaron Rodgers. Now you two can have one thanks to a pro championship belts. Hi, this is CJ Miles of the Cleveland Cavaliers, and you're listening to the Sports Fix.
Welcome back to the Sports Fix Live here on the SportsFix.net. J-Rock back with you as we roll on here with the show, heading into the final segment here. And, uh, of course, tonight you hear the, the music talking about playing some basketball. The final series of the season commences tonight, and uh, it's going to be a good one. Hey, uh, if you're a basketball fan, you've got the rematch. And I don't know if you heard during the uh, news earlier, interesting statistic that I didn't even notice until I heard it uh, of the, uh, was it 11, 12 matchups of uh, the repeat matchups in the finals. None that went to a game seven in the first series have gone to a game seven in the rematch series. So uh, for those of you that think you're looking at seven, if they did, it would be the first time in history that two teams rematched in the finals and went to back-to-back seven-game series. Uh, A lot of people think that that is the uh, foregone conclusion of what's going to happen here as these two teams. A lot of talk this week, too. Uh, Historically, too, uh, Horace Grant. I'm going to talk about all of that here and, of course, uh, continue to keep the conversation going. The phone lines, I will reopen them back up here. 216-539-7535. If you've got a take, let me know who you think's got this. The Heat or the Spurs, who's going to take this, how many games. Hit us up with your thoughts. On Facebook and Twitter, facebook.com slash the sports fix. Tweet with us at the sports fix CLE and tell me who you got Spurs or Heat and how many games they're going to take it. And of course, you can email us the sports fix at AOL.com 216 539 7535, the number to call. And yeah, those two teams getting at it, they've taken different paths to get there here. And, um, you know, you talk a lot. Uh, you've got the two teams. And LeBron, you know, one of the things. And, and you know what? All uh, teams uh, find slights. They find reasons to motivate themselves to get fired up. And the Heat are doing that in a way uh, with their bravado heading into this series. Uh, talking about being upset that a lot of people, myself included. I mean, I'm one of those people that uh, definitely thinks that the, the San Antonio Spurs lost last year's finals much more than the uh, Miami Heat won. And I'm not trying to take anything away from anybody. At the end of the day, the ball bounced the way it did. The shot goes in the way it does. Ray Allen hits the three-pointer, and the Heat did win game set. I mean, what a competitive series that they had last year. Um, you know, just back and forth with those games, but the Heat were continually on the ropes and rocking and and able to stay alive. So I'll give them that. But I truly look at last year as just uh, wow. Uh, I think, and that's why I think the Spurs come in even more focused and motivated. And uh, and I think the Spurs get this done. And I I predicted a six game series before I even knew about the statistic about these seven games. I thought the Heat are going to not only lose this series, but I think the Spurs are going to take it. In six games, uh, that's just me looking at things, and uh, and again, I want to know what you guys think about that. But uh, you know, so LeBron and Wade and those guys, Ray Allen, talked about being a bit upset at the perception that they didn't earn that championship last year. Like, I'm not going to take that away from them, but again, I'm in the camp that believes that the Spurs lost that title uh, any bit as much as somebody would believe that the Heat won it, but they did. And here are the two teams go. So no matter how you want to look at. At the whole thing, not only do you have a rematch in the finals, but you've got the Heat on the verge of doing some things that not many teams have done. They've already become only the third team in NBA history to make four consecutive finals as they've now made it every year since they came together there, losing in the first one to Dallas. And then we know what's gone in the last two as they beat the two teams that just met for the right to face them here, Oklahoma City and last year San Antonio. So if they win, Miami will have a three-peat and they will be able to, and it will also be, I believe, the fourth championship in Miami Heat franchise history, which would tie them with the Spurs. Uh, with four championships for each of those franchises. And then, of course, the teams still above them. You've got the Celtics, you've got the Lakers, and you've got the, uh, you've got the, of course, the Chicago Bulls, Michael Jordan, and those teams that had the back to back runs of, of three peats there. And, uh, and definitely a lot. Speaking of those Bulls, by the way, Horace Grant, I wanted to start there and talk a little bit about that. He spoke up this week and talked about the, and I always love the, uh, this conversation. It's always, it always comes up, especially with the, in the era of the, uh, the stacked team, as you will, of the super team, however you want to put it, the way people look at what Miami did when they put that team together. Horace Grant talking about the, the, uh, differences between the teams and how he, and I do too. 
that they believes that those Chicago Bulls teams of Jordan's run there, the two three P teams, better than this run of the Miami Heat as well. And I agree too. I mean, I think I, I definitely one hundred percent agree with that. I will not take away the fact that the Miami Heat did come together and put together a run. You've got to put the run of what this team did comparable to other teams that have done that. But uh, there's still, for people that want to just put them at the top of the mountain, there's a lot of room left to go when you start talking about that discussion and the greatest teams. You know, I mean, just uh, to me, the conversation with those Chicago teams ends with the fact that, you know, you a lot of people are talking about this Heat team and what's going to happen this summer with LeBron and these guys having opt-outs and all of that. They're looking, a lot of people are looking at this here if the Heat win as a culmination of what they came together to do. But think about it. I mean, this is the end of the beginning of what that Michael Jordan-led Chicago Bulls team did there in the 90s when they did it. Then Michael Jordan took some time off to go play some baseball. Then he came back to the game and they did it again. And I think that that's where you start getting into that separation level, into that next level stuff, you know? And so I just, I find it funny that a lot of people are looking at this as the culmination and proof of of what a great all time great team the Heat are, and I think it puts them in that discussion. I think it puts them on a level with a group of other teams you can talk about. But then you realize that where this is ending, and people see it as the summit, it was actually only the short summit of the bigger peak that. Uh, some of the greater teams have gone and done just keeping that in perspective and i know a lot of people i've talked with some people off the air about this in the last couple of days and some oh horace grant he's just he'd be in a homer for his own team but i i disagree even though i'm sure some of that plays a part of it and he was he was fair as well when he talked about he didn't just say well lebron couldn't have made it in our day because a lot of guys throw that out there and i i think that you know, murk, murk, murkies and muddies up the waters a little bit there when you're talking about that. Because, of course, LeBron could have played in other eras. He's got the size, the athleticism, the ability to do that. I don't know that he would have been as dominant. Maybe he would have. That's the great thing about trying to... Uh, project guys across errors, you know, video game type stuff that you can't actually see in real life. Um, I know that just, you know, point blank, uh, one thing that Horace Grant pointed to was the dominance of those Bulls teams. And, and what's this is a good point because realize that we're talking about a much more stacked Eastern Conference field that they went through, not even counting their opponents in the NBA Finals. What do you guys, what do we all say for the last few years? You got the Eastern Conference is the Heat and whoever is going to play them in the Finals and whatever. Uh, you know, there's no, I don't want to say there's no competition, but I mean, this. that's why everybody got so fired up about the Pacers because they felt like maybe you had somebody that was going to be able to come up and match up with the, with the Miami Heat. So look at the difference. Look at the teams and, and the groups. I mean, the Cavs were just one of them, those 90s Cavs teams. But I mean, look at whether you're talking about the Pistons, you're talking about those young Pacers teams and Reggie Miller and those guys coming up, those Nick teams. I mean, you had uh, Orlando at the time and Charlotte when they had their young nucleuses with Hardaway and Shaq and, and Alonzo Mourning and, and Larry Johnson. The era, the, the depth of those teams, the Eastern Conference that those Bulls teams fought through. Not only that, but then look at the fact that they swept, they had five sweeps in their three-peat run. The one that Horace Grant was referring to during that Five sweeps, only one game seven. From 91 to 93, the Chicago Bulls won 80% of their playoff games. Um, and the next, you know, and again, and I'll give LeBron James and this Heat credit, but during a much weaker period with less competition, they've won 72% of their playoff games during this run that they've had 2012 through this year, during the, the three-year run here, uh, not counting the first year where they lost in the uh, NBA Finals. So even there, not as dominant in a much weaker area. So, I mean, that really kind of does the argument for you there. But uh, anyways, looking at that, it made me, as I was doing this, it made me look further. And I'll tell you what, here's something that kind of blew my mind a little bit. Now, you guys know that you clearly I make it very clear my thoughts about LeBron James great basketball player terrible person don't want him back here in Cleveland I'm mean, plain and simple I can separate the two 
But I want to have a, a little bit of an honest conversation here because this kind of caught me by surprise. I know we've talked uh, tons about how Cleveland feels, and, and I don't care what a radio station or somebody that's jumping on the bandwagon will tell you. I firmly believe, and I see it from the people that we talk to, I mean, a good cross-section of Cleveland sports fans, it is clearly still at least 60 to 70% negative on the... Now, I will give him credit because when he left, do you want LeBron back was 90-10? No. And and he's clearly crept up and got 20, 30% of that fan base to swing back. But it's still easily, I would say, if you wanted to be fair and put percentages on it, probably about two-thirds to one-third. 66% no as far as wanting him back and, and, and being popular with the city of Cleveland. But, but... Now, looking at that, I said, man, when I when I came across what I'm going to reference here, which is an article, Mind of the Fan, it was called. It was done by Ethan Strauss. And uh, I said, OK, I know how we feel about LeBron in Cleveland here. That's different. But one of the reasons he left, well, the main reason he left, and, and people stressed this, even people that felt bad for what he did to Cleveland, stressed that he left because he was going to to create his legacy to fulfill it to win these championships to be what uh his his talent is meant to be and fulfill the legacy of what he should be that was the argument that people made for him doing what he did so well it was a bad thing but it was what had to be done for the good of basketball for the good of lebron and his brand and his legacy that word was thrown out there uh, uh, ad nauseum but check it out when you look nationally Here's what's amazing. Now, I remember the day LeBron left. I remember the next show that we did when we were on the air and all of that. And I said it, and I know you guys have heard me because I repeated here on the show a lot. My thoughts when they put that that Miami Heat team together and they, they stacked it up however you want to frame it. I said, this is a can't win situation for LeBron James, being totally fair and taking the anti-LeBron aspect out of it. It's an, a no-win situation for him in the mind of the majority of fans and media because if you win, you were supposed to because you stacked your team and therefore you were only doing what you were supposed to do. It kind of shortchanges the accomplishment. And if you don't win, then that's that's what you get for stacking the team. And everybody's like, ha ha, you stacked your team and you didn't win. Much like what happened in the first season of the Heat coming together to make their run. So I thought, man, at the end of the day, what you did was to fix your, your to create your legacy. And, it, and really, you heard it, even winning. And I'll tell you, that, but that was my thought, but I had no metrics or no nothing to back this up. And I come across this here, and it was a series of polls done, not just one poll. It was a series of polls done throughout basketball season. Um, and it looked at a lot of these, and I was really kind of surprised at what this showed nationally. Because, again, I thought as LeBron was successful, this is the truth. I thought national perspective, the more titles that they win, Naturally, because people, you know, it's easy to diss Cleveland in the national media and the national fan base anyway. So they'll just chalk it up as well. LeBron, you know, they'll forget and they'll, they'll, the championships will kind of heal because that was the argument that was made when he left was when he wins three or four rings, then everybody will forget about what he does to Cleveland. But what is, is crazy is it's kind of been the opposite. The, the day or the season after LeBron left Cleveland, when LeBron left Cleveland, of all the people polled at that time in this similar uh, poll throughout the, the basketball season, done with fans across the NBA, uh, he went from fifteen, almost sixteen percent of people at the 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 time of the decision said that he was uh, LeBron James was their favorite player in the NBA. He dropped to under 10% after uh, the season after the decision of people saying that he was uh, their favorite player. And then he even dropped another almost 2% after they lost to Dallas because a lot of people, and you guys got to remember, that was when they were uh, making the jokes about Dirk. and They just kind of came across, they really turned a lot of people off nationally that first season with the way they dealt with uh, putting that team together, you know? So, um 
and, and really, that's that's the, the the truth of it there. But it was the the opposite as you watch. He's been to four finals in a row, and he's won two, going for potentially three championships here in a row, and yet he has been unable to even get back to the level of popularity that he was at before he left Cleveland. And I'm not talking about in Cleveland. I'm talking about nationally. And uh, and I'll tell you what, here is one, uh, the numbers that I point to here. Uh, it looked back at avid NBA fans and casual NBA fans. And really, you could see that LeBron was hurt the most by casual fans more than the hardcore fan base. Of, of the four seasons since he's left, uh, LeBron has still failed to recover to levels even of where he was at before the decision amongst casual fans. And that's with the success and that's with the popularity. And that's some interesting splits, too. They even broke a lot of this down across uh, racial lines, uh, looking at blacks and whites and Hispanic fans. And there really is. A very amazing difference, being totally honest about this. And what's funny, too, in comparison to these numbers, no basketball player has ever come close to the popularity levels of Michael Jordan. Uh, During his peak, 50% of fans called Michael Jordan uh, their favorite player uh, at the time he was playing. I mean, the next closest one of some of the guys on this list was uh, Shaq and LeBron at their peak, getting nearly... 20% 20% of fans to say that. I just show you how leaps and bounds. But uh, when you look at the racial breakdowns, I, I got to tell you, it's really quite, uh, it's quite striking to me because amongst white fans, the, I don't want to say hatred, but the dislike of LeBron James was much more pronounced than it was when you look at black and Hispanic fans. Uh, and, and the same thing with the Miami heat in general, Uh, As far as the team popularity, very striking. I mean, when you look at the bar graphs and you see the percentages, there really is a a difference there. Take that for what it's worth. Uh, And and, and again, I'm sure that there's factors that may be a part of the way this put together that make that different. But, uh, you know, looking at... Looking at it like that, it's, you cannot uh, you cannot lie about the uh, popularity there, and it shows that uh, since the move, LeBron has recovered his popularity the most amongst African American NBA fans. However, has still not recovered to pre decision levels, but has gotten right at pre decision levels. Uh, he's come nearly that way with Hispanic fans, and then obviously uh, Caucasian fans, the furthest down on the list, but. Uh, the other thing, too, it even gets into the ratings, breaks down the ratings pattern across all of the Miami Heat games, and the ratings nearly double in the games where the Miami Heat are facing elimination uh, than they do in the in any of the other games, which is, I mean, that's clear as day. Uh, people tuning in to see the Miami Heat lose, which is something that has never changed since the time they put that team together. And it's just amazing that still four years down the road, it has gotten even better. And uh, by the way, uh, even looking at the uh, the difference between the ratings, and this will show you just popularity-wise, you know, people love to make the LeBron and the Michael Jordan comparisons, um, and it shows the difference in how much the general public uh, wanted uh, Jordan's teams in the finals and success compared to LeBron. Uh, the third time in a row in the finals for Michael Jordan and his uh, Chicago Bulls teams, nearly an 18 average rating uh, when the ratings came out. And the Nielsen's ratings, LeBron's third finals, nearly half of that. It's just a hair over 10. And uh, and again, you look through the different samples that I've talked about here, and it shows that uh, there was there's there's a dramatic difference in not only the popularity but again the way the ratings spike along the line when the Miami Heat find themselves on the verge of elimination is just quite amazing and it speaks to the fact uh, as a matter of fact ratings peaked during the Miami Heat run five of six of the highest rated Miami Heat games were immediately following heat losses uh, which literally shows players uh fans living vicariously through seeing the miami heat lose and anyways a lot of that boils down to this just plain and simple taking all of those factors together lebron james today with all of the championships and accolades that he's won is roughly 30 percent less popular with the average nba fan 
than he was during his time at the peak when he left Cleveland. And he's 19% less popular amongst hardcore NBA fans than he was in that day, which shows you the difference. Hardcore fans obviously give more appreciation to his level of play. Uh, therefore, there's nearly a 10% difference. But amazing, long story short to me, taking all the bias out of it, I find it amazing on a national level that winning and succeeding and winning those championships, LeBron could be nearly 30% less popular with the average NBA fan than he was during his run here in Cleveland. And I think it just goes to show that that initial thing I started with kind of proves itself out to be true that, and and Hey, at the end of the day, his, his rings are his and he can, he can, you know, keep them and love them. And I get it. You won those things and they're accolades that can never be taken away from you personally, but it just goes to show that that adage that I said was true regardless of how how much success that team had when they were put together at the end of the day he I, I truly believe the championships that he won are undervalued and I'm saying that as somebody who doesn't care for what Miami did but he'll never even get the true respect for what that team was able to do from fans from media from other players because of the way it put together in a way you can say it's unfair i don't feel any any the bad feelings i don't feel sorry for him at all but it is in a way it's unfair if you wanted to be honest about it but fair doesn't matter but it, it is because they did win but because of everything involved and the way people perceived it as the playground stacking of the team picking the best players and putting them together whether you believe that or not the average belief of that tainted the wins that they did get which is kind of a shame you know but at the same time it's what i knew was going to happen and just i find it funny that outside of cleveland uh, that those feelings did not change as much as you thought they did because i really thought that nationally after one or two titles the rest of the nation would say who cares what happened in cleveland lebron james is my favorite player but really he has not had that bounce back Uh, that you would expect it just goes to show man that a lot of people to this day just look at it as as what it was and and it's just funny i saw that and i was really amazed i would have been totally not surprised if those numbers were just cleveland but to see it be nationally and to, to see it broke down across different age groups different race groups different everything and see the differences you can really see just how polarizing he became after that. And again, intriguing the fact that those ratings spike when the Heat are on the verge of being eliminated and having it handed to him. It just goes to show you that uh, there is, uh, at least from a merchandising and a uh, a draw perspective, television ratings and money, there's, uh, there's value in a bad guy because every good guy needs a bad guy to beat and, uh, and every fan needs a good guy to root for and a bad guy to root against and the Miami Heat became a lot of people's team to root against apparently but uh, that sets the stage for tonight game one of the NBA finals as these two teams look to rematch and I I, I already made my prediction to start things off I think that the Spurs take this thing in six I really do and uh, I think the end of the run comes for Miami and then the fun can begin as far as what may or may not happen for those various players on the team but I think it's going to be a good series it's going to be a good fight I think you're going to see be honest with you I think this is going to closely resemble the Thunder and the Spurs series I think you're going to see a a pair of teams that trade big victories early I think you're going to see Um, You know, because we saw that, the the wide variety in that Thunder series of the victories. So I think you're going to see maybe some back and forth. But I believe games five and six, you'll see the Spurs uh, begin to pull away from that thing. I think they have a a better rounded team. It's going to be big what Kawhi Leonard steps up and does. I mean, they're going to need, as they always do, contributions across the board. Tony Parker's health is going to be really important to uh, what happens with the Spurs because obviously – if that was to go south, if there's problems with his health, and that completely changes everything, uh, especially defensively, the way the Heat put things together, the, the way they funnel things down into the paint. So that's going to be something to keep an eye on. But uh, at the end of the day, uh, it's going to be a hell of a series, I think. And I think that the Spurs take it. Keep Ray Allen 
away from the three-point line. I'm just going to throw that out there now. I <laughs> The other day, when uh, the Pacers series, when Ray Allen hit a couple of threes down the stretch, uh, I have a friend, and uh, we, you know, we text each other a lot during the games, uh, just making jokes about inside jokes about things, and we always call Ray Allen Jesus. We always do from the, the He Got Game movie, and uh, and we've joked for years. We'll send each other texts. I'm talking Celtics. I'm talking Heat. All of that. We'll send each other texts whenever somebody in a big game leaves Ray Allen open for three and uh, we'll always make jokes about it. You don't leave Jesus open, you know? And uh, the other day they did it again. And I just texted my buddy and I said, look, it's 2014. And I am amazed that teams still leave Jesus wide open for threes at the end of big games. I mean, he's been doing this for how many years now? And you still like either he should come with a radar. Like there should be, there should be no way that that guy gets himself open for three anywhere near the tail end of a important basketball game, yet somehow it happens each and every year. That's going to be really important for Miami to make sure that they don't, or excuse me, for the Spurs to make sure that they don't allow that to happen because as we saw, that shifted the whole thing last year. So it's going to be interesting. It's going to start tonight. Of course, I'm sure over the next week and a half, we're going to talk about this as it continues to roll on. Let's see what happens when round one happens tonight. It is the Spurs and the Miami Heat game one of the NBA Finals. It's tonight. It's on ABC. Tip-off is at 9 p.m. Perfectly timed because the Indians don't play tonight. You get a day off after that sweep, baby. Feeling good about that. And then they get ready to head down to Texas and take on the Rangers tomorrow. You, Darvish, will preview that tomorrow. Jonathan Knight. The sports writer extraordinaire, he's going to be here with us in the house, as always, a fun time. Guys, enjoy the night. Enjoy the day off after some late-night try of baseball last night. Enjoy the finals if you guys are into that, and come back here tomorrow no matter what you do tonight and talk to us about it. Have some fun tonight, and let's talk about it tomorrow. Well, let's not talk about the fun, unless it's, like, really crazy and you got, like, if a story involves, like, a water buffalo and a clown or something, then maybe we got something to talk about. But no matter what, come back here tomorrow live at noon. Same bad channel, same bad time right here on the Sports Fix. Until then, we love you, Cleveland. Have a great night. We'll see you tomorrow. Call them kids the cardiac, rock car, science in the tower city, all of that. Warehouse district, Euclid corridor, and all the flat. You know that I'm a tribes fan, and I love slime in. Crockett Park's the perfect place for me to spend some time in. Baby, this is Cleveland, it is so much more to us. You can even go to Severance Hall to see an orchestra. In Pretty. So much hate up in this city, bitty city If you can make it here, you can make it anywhere Put your hands up in the air, everybody say yeah, yeah, yeah